Bismillahirrahmanirrahim wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad and wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Peace and love, y'all. I'm Brother Ali. This is the Travelers Podcast, and we're still here. The podcast is not over. Last week, I was traveling in America, and I wanted to make an episode, a solo episode, talking about and processing and just kind of thinking through stuff that came up in the past several conversations with the past several guests. And so completely by myself without really checking in with BK1, I made recorded this episode and I called it It's Been a Great Run because I was thinking about the run of the past several conversations and installments of the podcast. And so I posted it. I was on off and on flights and, you know, crazy sleep schedule and all this stuff. So I posted it and didn't really circle back to check the comments for a minute. And because it was called It's Been a Great Run and it's a three hour, 20 minute episode. It's like I just talked and talked and talked. And so many other comments were like, no, say it ain't so. Don't end the podcast. And um, I just didn't even think about the fact that it could be read that way. So the podcast is not over. Uh, if you're like two hours into that three and a half hour episode last week and you're like, man, when's the part where he's going to address the end of the podcast? The podcast is not over. We're back this week uh, with one of my dear friends, Jake One. Uh, Jake is a profoundly accomplished hip hop producer who comes out of Seattle and Seattle has an incredible scene. So he's part of a, a really amazing cohort, um, you know, complete with elders like Sir Mix-a-Lot and also uh, Ish from Shabazz Palace, who also had the most uh, you know, prominent role in Diggable Planets um, and elders, you know, our elder statesmen, kind of our mentors, uh, in particular, a brother by the name of John Moore who was an MC on his own called Wordsayer. And he really, we called him the unofficial mayor or the hip hop mayor of Seattle. And he passed away a few years ago. If you look, the video that I have called Own Light was filmed in Washington state and is dedicated to the memory of, of John Moore. His son is also an incredible producer. You'll hear me and Jake talk about that. But then, you know, there's a lot of incredible hip hop music that's come out of Seattle in our generation. So producers like Jake One and I would say his counterpart, Vitamin D, you know, really amazing producer. Um, and just a lot of dope hip hop music that's come out of there. You know, obviously you had Macklemore breakthrough and, and you know, really go become very mainstream and popular. But that the scene there is really amazing. And in the in the Pacific Northwest in general, you know, you got Boom Bat Project and you got Old Dominion and um, man, if I start shouting people out, I'll probably miss somebody. We have my man Grinch. <laughs> Grinch that that looks so much like me. People call him Brother Smiley. <laughs> but my man Grinch, really dear beloved friend of mine. Um, man, there's a group called The Satisfaction, super dope. Uh, Shabazz Palace that I mentioned, man, you got uh, the the um, the battle rapper Immaculate. It's a lot of really dope people that come out of that area, and so um, yeah, I'm really blessed to be, I would say, an unofficial or like an extended family kind of part of that Seattle hip hop scene. I got to shout out Melly, who's a great um, promoter from Seattle. Uh, also, my man Sam Chesnu, you know what I mean, and we call Sherpa Co. Beautiful, incredible people. So Jake One came up in that scene, you know. Uh, oh, and also shout out to Supreme, DJ Supreme, you know, record collector, beat digger, DJ, you know, curator. These are all the people that are in these these communities that really make it what it is. But Jake was somebody that has just been extremely consistent and went to the heights of hip hop production. I mean, he produced for Dr. Dre. There's a song called Three Kings with Dr. Dre, Jay-Z, and Rick Ross. You know what I'm saying? He worked with J. Cole over repeatedly. Um, you know, Drake, uh, he won, he's won Grammys. He worked with Nipsey Hussle. Uh, he's the one who introduced me to Mac Miller. There's so many of the, of the greats of our time. Jake has worked with them. But of all these amazing people that he's worked with, he's only made full albums with, I think, two of us. And that's Freeway and myself. And so we made an album with him uh, that I did called Morning in America and Dreaming in Color. So I started working with him before I went to Hajj, went to Mecca. And then when I came back, 
I was ready to dive all the way in. And so I actually went and got an apartment in Seattle. I live right around the corner from John Moore. And that was a really formative time for me. And working with Jake has been one of the real profound blessings of my career and life. So I'm really honored that he sat and we just had a conversation. You know, I, I, I go into these conversations thinking if we can do some sort of retrospective where we start in the beginning and then do it in some sort of linear way, that that'll be cool. But I really just try as much as possible, especially with people that I know really well, to just feel what their energy is like. And then, you know, I have my points along the way that I would like to hit. And so hopefully you enjoy this, uh, this conversation. We're brought to you as always by the Zakat Foundation, Z-A-K-A-T. That's the way that Muslims frame the idea of charity, you know, and every spiritual system and every, I think every program for just being a good human being deals with sharing and giving. It's really important. And if you talk to people about financial planning, and even growing your finances, they'll say you have to start with giving. Part of your money has to be for saving, part for investing. You should live below your means. But all of them will actually say that it feels counterproductive that one of the main ways to grow your money is actually by giving. But it's really important to do that. Zakat Foundation works around the world in places where human beings are in need. And one of the things that I love about them is that they're very creative. They don't operate just like a big corporation. They work in partnership with people on the ground. You know, it's very easy to give money in ways that are actually really harmful. And so Zakat Foundation works with people on the ground. They also really invest in culture, which is why they've supported and sponsored this podcast from day one. And that's a very unique thing, you know, the understanding that what we're trying to do is really shift the way that life is lived to bring dignity back to human life. And culture is a big part of that. So head to Zakat, Z-A-K-A-T-U-S. That's their, that's them on social media. Go to Zakat US, check out the things that they do and put a few dollars on something, whether it's a little bit or a lot, whatever you can give and know that it goes to really benefiting human beings. Uh, and if you go to their website, it's zakat.org. Uh, and it's, it's really extremely dope work. So I hope you enjoy this episode of the Travelers Podcast with my man, Jake One. How you feeling, brother? Man, I'm tired. We, we went hard in the earth these last five days, but it's, it, was, it was all fun stuff. So the crazy thing is they threw free a birthday party on Sunday and I was there and didn't even, you know, I didn't know he was even in New York. They threw like him a surprise party. So I missed him somehow oh yeah he was at the pretty wild yeah he went to the baseline thing right you you saw that the the baseline exhibit yeah but i i went there on tuesday Uh. like i was there i was at that too we just happened to go it wasn't like you know that was that was pretty cool i mean you know what's funny about the i don't know if i'm just like a hater at this point but i'm just like all right it's really dope to see Jay-Z get this adulation on a public, like from the public library, all that's great. But like, he's not the only rapper that matters to me. You know what I mean? So like, why does he get everything? Like Rakim can't get that or something, you know, I don't know. I don't care about the money he made in his business. That means nothing to me, you know what I mean? So like, it seems like it's turned into that thing. Like you can be this, it's like, nah, you really can't. There's how many billionaires? Like this isn't something to aspire to. Yeah. It's it's always a tough it's, it's always a tough thing with him. That's that's part that's part of my hating. That's that's maybe me being a hater. I don't know. I mean, I I don't got no problem with Jay Z at all. I just feel like he's not the only thing, you know. Yeah, and to me, it's proof that like you have to fight to get yourself seen in a certain light on the business world for them to recognize what you did in the art. Like, man, he had to have how many? He had to have- Right, which is yeah, stupid. I'm saying like he had to have more gold records than everybody and platinum and or whatever else. And then write a whole book about himself. The Beatles and all yeah. this. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It just reminds me of that thing where Chris Rock was saying, he was like, I live in this neighborhood they live in where he's like, I live there. And then Jay-Z, the greatest rapper, lives there. And then, uh, you know, I think it was- um, Mary J. Blythe lives here. And then just some white dentist. Oh, yeah. It was like, yeah. man, for a black dentist to be there, he would have had to invent teeth. 
You know what I'm saying? Like just how far you have to go to just get respected, acknowledged. Right. And and I and I mean, I don't know, man, I guess uh equality is that a black dude should be able to be a dirty businessman and make as much money as anybody. That's great. You know what I mean? Or just take advantage of the system. That's all great. But like it's just not to me what we should be aspiring to. And it's not like it's just not reality. Yeah. You know. But good for him. He's obviously, I mean, he, is he, he's maybe the best rapper ever. He's a real, you know, I can't really argue that, you know, he's up there. He has done everything imaginable to take away any argument you have against that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just been too long. Yeah. It's been too long, man. He just had, it just was too long. When I really look at, because when I was at that the Rock the Bell thing, I'm like, damn, these dudes are only hot for like four years, two years, one year. All the people that were up there that I love, right? right. And I'm like, man, a lot, a lot of these other guys that came after them were longer. They're hot, way longer, way like not like ten times as long, you know. So like, and I understand the music was changing in a different way that made it probably impossible for them to keep. I just think about like Run DMC in '94. I just like couldn't get that out of my brain, like what that looked like and how stupid it right, looked to right, me at the right. time. Down with the king. They and were all that. still like not even thirty years old. Yeah, they weren't even thirty years old. Yeah, and they and they and they they hadn't even been in it for ten years at that point. <laughs> no, that was that was that was basically ten year point. You know what I mean? So. It, it's it's weird. All, all that all, I I shouldn't like have any mixed emotions about because it, it doesn't. It's not like I'm not the one being shunned or anybody I really care about isn't. But like I think there's so much all this hip hop fifty people are getting really mad about this person not getting. And I'm just like, dog. There's a thousand people that made a real impact in this thing. Everybody ain't gonna get a knowledge. It's just what it is. Right. You know, like it's just everybody's not gonna get the the big. You know presentation on stage <laughs> like it's even dudes that had a hell of a run right and it's just crazy how much you have to fight to be acknowledged that's its own fight like when it's happening you know what i'm saying like marketing right. yourself well, and you have happening. to take that you have to take that on right yeah. and you have to become that person if you're not if you're not naturally that person then you have to decide like that's where that's where I come from, and, and a lot of the people that I roll with, it's like right. we had to decide. Like, do I want to be a person that endlessly markets myself? Because yeah. if the answer is no, I'm not going to get as far as a lot of other people are going to get. Right. And you have to be okay with that. It's like, just, man, it's we just all the make nature our decisions. Of it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 really interesting. That whole component, man. Like, I mean, I just I just think, I keep thinking about the '80s rappers because that's what I you know grew up on, yeah. and it's like they just don't even exist, man. It, it's like rap only started when Illmatic came out to like modern times, right? Like for whatever reason, that's that is somehow carried on as this mythical thing that the other stuff didn't, and I don't really know why, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I guess you get further and further away from something, then what actually happened in the moment isn't real, you know? Yeah. And they can change the story. <laughs> I mean, Hove has changed the story that Reasonable Doubt was a classic when it dropped. It wasn't. No, man. It wasn't even comparable to like a Illmatic or Wu-Tang. It was not on that level. It was a great, I thought it was dope. It's it crazy because when that. you go back each year, like I remember the source would do these retrospective things. And I was never a person that had a lot of money and I never could buy everything. But when I look at every year, like from the right. time that I started listening to rap in like 85, all the way up until you know, the time that they stopped doing that. I had all the records that they said were important. Those were the ones that I just naturally was buying. And I had I had all of the major important right. drinks. I might only buy 10 albums a year, but I had all the important ones every year. I did not have reasonable doubt. Right. I liked AZ better than I liked Jay-Z in those days. I mean, Sugar Hill definitely played more places than Jay-Z's songs were at that point. You know, like just... Just what it was, you know? Yeah. But he, the crazy thing was him is he realized even like five years in, like, no, we're calling Reasonable Doubt a classic. Right. He did it way early. It was like, no, this is a classic. Yeah. He he mentioned that so many oh, times. Oh, yeah. That wasn't necessary. It was every bit as important as like, my dad left. I used to sell crack. Now, I, now I'm the best <laughs> rapper. I'm the king of New York. My first album is a classic. And like these things are not debatable, you know what I'm saying? If you want to be down with me, and all, all, 
But also Rockefeller was a forever dynasty and legacy that would live forever and ever and ever. And then two, three years later, he's like, nah, I'm done with this. <laughs> oh, cool. Peace. But I will say, <laughs> all this being said, I, I do think I do think he's the best though. I still I think that. Yeah. I, I do too. I do too. It's just like I think I think it's like anything. To get to that point of adulation and stick that long, you have to make choices that aren't necessarily easy choices and palatable choices all the time for everybody. And clearly he didn't give a f he did come in and say he was a hustler and that's what it was. Yeah. You know? But he but then you're you're telling the art thing at the same time as all these like components go together, you're just like, eh, you know, but he clearly won out. I mean, just just by virtue of how long you It's a trip. Like when we were kids, like we grew up kind of clowning uh, Little Richard. Like that was always like whenever somebody showed Little Richard, it was like, I invented it. Right. I'm the originator. I, they're all copying yeah. me. Blah, blah, blah. But yeah. it's like, do, if he didn't do that, then he would have been written out of history. They would act like Elvis didn't open for him. We wouldn't have thought it. We wouldn't have thought like about it. Like he had right. to do that. If he didn't do that... You know what I'm saying? But then you clown them, then we all clowned him for it. But like, man, he really was about to be written out of history if he didn't right. if he didn't make that stand like that. For sure. No, it's it's I don't know, man. I mean, there's just also the part of just like, you know, you think of like rap as being a young person's thing. I mean, you're like, you're like, damn, 50 years old. I mean, there's music that came out when I was 40, you know, when I was seven, eight years old that still sticks with me. And that seemed, I mean, I think about in 1990, I would think of like what the 50s music represented to me. And it just seemed stupid, right? right? It's clearly not something I wanted anything to do with. So we are so far away from the beginning. And there's been so many iterations. Like it's kind of natural. This stuff is going to go off the, off the rails, you know? Yeah. I know you heard the... <laughs> Sometimes hilarious things happen and I'm like, man, I wish I wish that I could be around like you and like John just to hear the conversation. You know what I mean? Like that, man, that Melly Mel diss track for Eminem, man. I tried, man. I tried to listen. I just, it, the the thing I clicked on, it seemed like there was just bombs dropping. Like There were tags. There were tags on it. When it I was just like, yeah, this ain't. Like it got released with tags already on it. I don't want that, man. Like I can't even, like I was... It just sounded like a siren and a snare in him. He did sound like Melly Mel, though. I don't know. I mean, what he was saying, you know, that's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like the thing is, <laughs> Melly Mel has a real, he's somebody that should be salty. Yes. To me, for what he did for rap and his place, he does not get what he, he never got what he deserved. So like, I understand the bitterness, right? right? Like, and I mean, I know more Melly Mel lyrics than Eminem personally, but you know, it's, that's, a, that's my age too at the same time, right? Yeah. Well, it's a trip too, because if you think about like, you know, he was more well-known than Grandmaster Kaz outside of the culture at that time. But everybody that was there is right. like, man, Grandmaster Kaz, like you know, what I'm Kaz saying is the one. They're yeah. like, yeah, man, cool. Mo D and specifically Mo D, uh, Chuck D, Rakim, all of those guys have been like, man, Grandmaster Kaz is the the reason that I rhyme the way that I rhyme. Even though they love Melly Mel, but Melly Mel was down with a record label and Kaz yeah, right. got jerked, but it wasn't. But Kaz, I feel like from just staying involved. You know what I'm saying? Like Kaz always stayed involved and he made sure that you knew that he wrote the original lyrics for Rapper's Delight, but he never got bitter. He stayed DJing, he stayed producing, he's in all the documentaries. But, but, you, but you know why? He didn't get bitter because he didn't have a real taste of mm. it. And I think when you have a real taste of like what it could have been, and he, I mean, Melly Mel was doing shows and getting money at one point. Yeah. And then to just get wiped out like that, it's even, it's sure it's way harder to swallow that, you know, like, um, I mean, it's even like I was listening to it when I was watching Run DMC and they're talking about, could never be old school. And it's just hilarious. Like, dip guys were calling people old school seven years after rap started. <laughs> so, like, yeah. and even to just, realize that, like, it's, from it's from a competitive all accounts, thing. Yes. And part of the thing, part of the thing definitely that's like built into it is like for me to get on, I'm going to knock off. I'm going to knock those people off so that I can get my thing. Always. 
Like, man, KRS is the one that took Melly Mel out, like, officially. Like, they all talk about this one particular day. That's what For Still sure. Number One is about. Yeah. And the, like, the Latin Quarter. Yeah, man. Yeah, the Latin Quarter battle. Like, that's the official moment where... And I'm sure, you know, 1987, Melly Mel probably thinks, like, yeah, I'm like, I could get... I'm going to make another hit on Melly Mel. And, but probably not, still. But that just made it official, right? Like, this new thing came around that was so different than him. Um and just, I mean, it, I just, when I hear old dudes complain about rap, it just really feel, you just have to think of all these things that happened before youth and so many people got wrong, so much worse. You know what I mean? Like, like man, Kumo D taking out Busy B. It's just not even fair. Like, it's not even the same type of MC. Nah, man. It's like, nah. you know what I'm saying? Like, Busy B is on, is on stage at Harlem World, like, doing what he always does, having fun. And then here comes some dude, like, I'm the super duper part of Royal Hop of Just like, that's not even fair. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, it's like, it's like Niall Rogers being the best rhythm guitar player going against a dude that's just a solo master. It's not the same thing. They don't do the yeah. same thing. Now, for me, I probably like Niall Rogers better because I like the records that he made better. Because in the end, that's what all we can go off. And this is what, like with Kaz, we don't have the records. They, the records they did just weren't good. So like to the rest of the world outside of New York, that's all we can go is Melly Mel was the best for that time, you know? Because that's what we have is recorded music. Yeah, I'm glad the or mixtape even Kum things Man, Kumo D, Kumo D fell off hard too though. Like, like I think of what I thought of Kumo D in like 1990, I was just like, this he's terrible, get him out of here. But you couldn't tell me heartbeat was in this shit when I was a little kid at the same time. And he was revolutionary at what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, you listen to like, uh, what's the one, uh, the double time rapping. That was crazy for that time. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Super rapping was like really crazy, but it's weird by the time his solo career, like on record started by the time knowledge is King came, I think we were probably, cause me and you were the same age, even though you insist on calling me old head. <laughs> um, but like when, <laughs> When Knowledge is King came out, we were like 11 or 12, and it was already like the leather koofy and yeah, the big, it, it the was big over. glasses, and it was it already was a little bit like, yeah, ah, yeah. I think I like Big Daddy Kane better. I didn't even like how you like me now. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I loved Go See the Doctor, though, at the same time. So like that was like kind of the end for him in that way. But again, this is this is only five years from when he's basically inventing hella styles and rap, yeah. and then he goes to old that quick. And now it's like this shit happens every month. Yeah. <laughs> like there's a new dude that comes out with a variation of this thing somebody else did. And, you know, now they got the laser in the beat this week. And now we got to have the laser in the beat. It's it's so reactionary. Before it at least took the three months it took to press a record or whatever. I mean, just going to the studio, obviously, is so different. I really hate the old old school dude trope that, like, we were all different. We had to be unique. And y'all all have the not, same name. Not true. Yeah, man. It's like, dude, our names were all the same. Everybody. No, nobody ski. No, nobody ski. No, man, know, ski, on. MC the even just MC How this, and ice like, that, some La Rock. Rock this, ski that. Like, man, we all had the same. Everybody, they're like, man, we had in our our beats didn't all sound the same. Like, we all rapped on the same 12 <laughs> break beats, man. Like how many people rapped on the Funky Drummer right. and Superstition and all of those? We all rapped on the same beat. Or, or even 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 later in the '90s era when they're all everybody's using Power of Zeus and this other break, Sons of Champa. Like it's the same. Everybody thing. rapped it's on just, George Clinton. Everybody because, rapped on, you know what I'm saying? Right. By, uh, uh, James Brown. Like man, we all were doing the same thing too. But to us, we could hear the difference because we were in it. If you weren't in it, you couldn't hear the difference, and we're not in right. And these kid, these kids can tell you what the difference yes. is between this, and and there is a difference, obviously. So like, the part that cracks me up is when I I hear the dudes our age be like, "Well, man, you know, it just don't take no talent to make a beat now, man. I mean, you know, like this, it's just you know, it's the craft." I'm like, dog. Every beat that you like is two records just literally made to repeat. <laughs> right. I mean, right. if we're talking right, talent. Right, right, right. If we're just talking talent, I get all these, the things that went into picking those records. Come on, clearly I yes. know. That's my life. But at the same time, come on. Like, what do you think the, you know, Leon Ware was thinking about that shit when he heard that? Like, he was probably like, this is some bullshit. 
This is just I the first two bars of my record. No ever played before. <laughs> and it's just the first two bars. Right. Like, man, this is just the first two bars of my record. Like, you didn't do anything to it. The only reason it's in a different yeah. key is because it was the wrong tempo. But if they had stretching back then, they probably wouldn't even have changed the key. Man. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it, it, I, I always joke, like, when Soldier Boy came out, people are going to be like, man, I miss when rap was real. Like, when dudes like Soldier Boy came out. And we're at that point now. Because right, right, I hear right. guys that are that age complain about rap. Now, so, <laughs> you know, yeah. this, maybe that's just part of, like, maybe that's just part of, like, this experience of growing in any genre. I'm, I, I don't know if rock moves the same way, but I don't, I'm not really tapped in to say, but. I, I think there's something about aging where like we, we only, we only remember the memorable parts. We forget the things that are forgettable. So either yeah, something has to be really good or really bad for us to remember it. Right. Thousand percent. And there was plenty of mediocre in all facets of everything all the time. It's just, I will say it's easier to just be competent now than it was back then. That's the difference. That like, you can be kind of good without necessarily being that talented or that hard at working at this because so many things are kind of done for you. Whereas the ingenuity of those limitations we had made it so when a dude was ill, it really stood out. You know, yes. because most people are really bad. And there is, but that's one thing that every generation does say that I do believe is true. So like for us, we're looking at kids that are on a DAW and being like, yo, we had to, we had to make those records match on time. And that was not easy with a turntable and a, and an MPC that, that was a, or that was an SP. accomplishment. Yes. yes. And we only had 10 seconds of total sample time. And we, and that's true. But then there's people before us that were like, we had yeah. to somehow get our hands on a bass guitar and then learn how to play it. And then there's people before that. Like <laughs> right. I, just, I just saw something where somebody was saying, I think it was Aretha Franklin or somebody that was saying, we didn't have multi-track when we started. So the whole orchestra was in a room and everyone had to so nail live, it in the one joint. take. Yeah. You couldn't come back and recut your part. Right. So we all had to nail it. And we were recording three right. records a day. And each one of those generations are right. It's like, yes, you did have a level of- They're all yeah. right. Yeah. But I think this is how like, the craft get honed, gets honed in a different way. Like those dudes that were session musicians in the seventies that literally went and played. Like some of our favorite songs, they meant nothing to the dude that played guitar in it. They just put a chart in front of him. He's like, all right, do this next, you know? But they were so tapped in and they were just the best at what they did, you know, in the world. You had like a group of like 30 dudes that played on every record. Yeah. And it's not really like that anymore. I mean, it's, 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 it's a different, it's just a different thing, you know? Yeah. And it really, it still gets back to that, that thing of like, you have to being masterful is one thing and being able to stand out is a total, is a different thing. You can't choose that though. Right. Like some people just have it. And as much as you would want to be the star, you just, some guys, aren't the, most aren't the star, you know? And then there's like, some guys are stars, but they don't make good music. So it's like, all these things have to come together and that's never going to change. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like wh what is really cool to me now is that the kids choose their star. Like, like this girl, Ice Spice, I don't, man, I don't really know much about her music, but like she, they just saw her and was like, yep, we like that. It wasn't like a big conspiracy. Once it starts going, it becomes a conspiracy of what they put money into, but it has to react in a real natural way for it to even get to that point. You know, it's not like they're they're not signing many people like this person's dope. Yeah, let's develop the plan. It's like, nah, this person's already become a thing because they stood out mm -hmm. for whatever reason, good or bad. Yeah. There still is like there still is that that thing of the algorithm. Like the algorithms are still, still reward certain types of reaction, but a person still has to garner those reactions to even get that 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 system in motion. Right, but but I think I think even um, in our day, you know, just something like the parental advisory sticker was that right? Like, I mean, there was a probably when I was like in seventh grade, I wasn't buying nobody's album if it didn't have parental advisory on. Right. Like, if a dude wasn't wearing a starter on the front, then I didn't want to hear it. You know what I mean? Like, for whatever reason, it's no different. Like, now it's 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 a similar kind of thing. I don't know. To me, I just, I can see the parallels in a lot of these things that 
don't seem obvious, but I get like danger. We're covered in danger all the time or hyper not realistic versions of who you are is really what people want because nobody, nobody wants to be the regular self and look up to that for the most part, you know, at least in entertainment. Yeah. Yasin was saying he was like, in order to be famous, you have to be something that people aspire to be. You can't show them what they are. You have to show them, you got to reflect what they wish they were to be famous. He said to be rich. That is a thousand percent true. Yeah. yeah. He said, if you want to be rich, then you have to sell a lifestyle. So being famous is selling an image. Being rich, you sell a lifestyle right. that you can sell, that's, that costs a lot. Because then all of the companies and the corporations and everything, now you're making them money. You're making people want to spend money with them. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then, but to be loved is a different thing. He was like, to be loved is to show people, to reflect back to people what they really experience, what they really feel, their secrets like give a voice to their secrets. Right. So he was like, most people are, if you work hard, you might be one of those things if you're blessed. You know what I'm saying? So, and he said to be all three of those is almost impossible. And that's, and that's if, you, if you look at like a Jay-Z or a Drake, you see that they show people, they're famous because they show people an image that they wish they could be. They're, that's why they're famous. They're rich because they show you a lifestyle. And then if they're also beloved, it's because also somewhere in there, there's a human thing. The, in art, the art is actually really yeah, good. Yeah, man. Yeah. So Yasin was just like, man, he's like, you are, to me, he was like, you're beloved. He was like, you're not going to be famous and you're not going to be rich, but the people that know you are going to love you and you got to just be okay with that. And I'm like, you know what, man? That's I, right. I'm very happy with that explanation. And none of us can none of us can choose it, you know. I mean, how many guys that we knew that were, you know, pretty semi successful artists weren't happy with who was in the crowd? <laughs> you know, like your fans, you can't choose your fans. No. It just it resonates with certain people. Yeah, you know, you, you've seen over the years people try these wild swings to like catch something that they thought was, you know, maybe who they hang out with, maybe yes. what their real life is like. Yeah. Them people don't want them. Yeah. They they're not chosen by that. Yes. Uh, but but I mean, all all, all very, prog like really like avant-garde, progressive, pro-black music, always the fans were white. Yeah. I mean, that's going back to jazz and blues and everything, man. Like, I mean, when, when I went to some rock concert when I was a kid, it wasn't a lot of black people. Yeah. There. It just wasn't. It was a bunch of like hippies. That's who was into it because it was different. It was weird. And you had to embrace that <laughs> to be into it, you know? Yeah. And that was, a, it's interesting too, because just thinking about that, that's an aspirational thing too, but it's an aspirational, it's like cultural aspiration. It's like white people that are like starved for culture being like, man, I want culture. Like that. So I know if I go see the most avant garde thing, I'm being exposed to real culture. So those right. are the people where. To the realist. Whereas well, like people that are coming from the hood that are like, I got culture. I got all the culture I need. I need a car. Right, right. <laughs> I need to, like, I need some stability. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what can I be around that's going to like show, show me how to, how to build a, how to build some wealth. You know what I mean? Well, and, and I remember thinking like, you know, my dad and the type of guys that were into like the avant-garde jazz stuff, the free jazz and all that, like when I when after backpack rap had kind of been over, I was like, man, that was basically the same exact thing. Yes. Like it was like I am, you know, of this higher because I'm the the purest form, right? Like this is the realest hip hop, like mm -hmm. two turntables and a mic and a dude spinning on his head and and most people, you know, that are probably living those circumstances ain't got time to worry about that. They're just worrying about what moves them and what feels good to them. And that changes. Yeah. And there's also just the like, when something is, I look at it like, I know I'm part of something that's popping when like people that aren't rap fans or R&B fans that, you know, they're not like creators or whatever, like, you know, my kid wants to go to the concert. I'm like, okay, we tap regular people now. This is not, you know my normal circle of people that I expect to be into these things. And that's, you know, it's, that's hard to do. Yeah. It's just hard to yeah. do. Yeah. I think a lot of people, you're talking about your dad. So like, that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we get on the, on the record is, um, so my understanding and, and like, tell me if I'm right. Like I, th 
So your your dad, is it true? So I just I just know that you grew up being the only white person everywhere you were. Like you and your dad are like the only white people. <laughs> like I, I mean, I wouldn't say the only, but a, a rare, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, pretty pretty rare, I guess, in in a lot of situations. I wouldn't say the only like, I could if if somebody finds like when I played on the baseball team, then when I was ten years old, I'm probably the only white kid on the team. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is that was my life at that point, right? This is what I grew up in, and it wasn't probably till I got to like middle school I was like, wow, and I started really having like white friends, and I would go to like their neighborhood. I'd be like, damn, this is different, like. It just, it really seemed leave it to beaverish to me because there was a, it just element of like action when I was, you know, I had a family that watched me when I was a kid a lot, um, the Harris family. And probably from when I was a baby, they lived across the street and they just would offer to take me. And I kind of just became part of their family for like maybe the first 10 years of my life. So, and, and your dad was an attorney, right? Like your dad, was your dad a lawyer for the Black Panthers? He was not a lawyer for the Black Panthers. My mom, my mom was in um, the Weathermen. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with that. Of course. It was like Hell a yeah. pretty radical. Yeah. Um, you know, that was that was before I was born. But um, my dad was like an SDS, and I think they met doing in those days. You know, hitchhiking, whatever. You know, rabble rousing <laughs> stuff they were doing. Um, but yeah, like. My mom definitely, you know, was involved in a lot of radical stuff. And I think when she had me, she just totally tapped out on that. It just was like, no more. This is, um, you know. And my dad kind of just never stopped being that person. So as it's all right. So this, this is like a really full circle of happy thing that happened this week. There's a video of like some rally in South Africa in a stadium, right? And this dude does a political speech. I don't, I know none of the circumstances of what's being said or what it's about. He does this this speech at the end of it they play the john cena beat and like fire comes out and i was like <laughs> what the hell like how, how am i part of this but it made me think back to being a kid like you know when most kids got to on saturday go play ball in the park like my dad would be like we're going to sewer park and we're going to a sit-in at this diplomat for south africa at his house and i'm gonna get arrested today you know that was the kind of stuff we were doing you know when i was a kid and I'm not going to lie, I hated it. I just wanted to be regular. Mm -hmm. You know, my other friends didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I look at now the importance of it. And, you know, it was, it was it, to me, it was cool that I had a, a different, you know, upbringing. It made me everything who I am, you know. But something about seeing that <laughs> that video, I was like, this is a trip. Like, how, how did I live this life, you know? Um, but yeah, my dad ended up being a lawyer. He was a uh, con he worked construction for a long time. He got hurt, decided to be a lawyer. Being a lawyer was his plan B, I guess somehow, which is you know weird in itself. But he was definitely like a save the whales kind of lawyer. Like he he only took on people he thought that really needed him. So and he you know he hated the cops. He hated banks. You know all these things. So like he would he would take on like. You know, people suing the cops and stuff like that. I remember one time when I was younger-ish, he had got like, there was an inquest on like a police shooting um, of an autistic black kid who had like a toy squirt gun who they killed, obviously. Um, and I remember it was, he was, he celebrated because he got like one vote out of the 10 that was for his side. And I guess that had never even been done at that yeah. point. You know, it just shows you how fucked up these, these things yeah. are. Um, so like a lot of these things were in my face, but I, I just wanted to be a normal kid in the time, you know, and you're little, you're just like, like I mean, I, my dad would drive me off to school, just like blasting Coltrane or something like, damn, this is so embarrassing. Like, can I just get out the car and just be a regular kid? You know, can we um, just hear a new edition, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was none of that. It was none of that. And it was funny as I got into like records and I'm like, oh yeah, my dad kind of got some cool records. I'm going to steal some of these, you know? And and in a, in a weird, crazy thing with him, most parents are like, you know, you got to go to college and get a job. And my dad saw me down there making beats when I first started. And he was like, he told me, he was like, you're going to make it doing this because you love it so much. He's like, I don't even understand what this is, but this is the future. Mm. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. I didn't even think that much of it in the time. 
but you know, I think having like a radical parent like that definitely allowed me to be whatever I wanted to be, um, which was, you know, it was really cool. And just, you know, the, the environment I grew up in, I don't think I'd make the kind of music I did if I didn't come from that. I think like most white kids who were doing rap are from that. So, you know, it was, it was really just the first music I heard and the first music I identified as my music. Right. And like rap in that time was like, this is our shit. Fuck the parents, fuck the old people, they hated it. I mean, it was, and when I, when I listen to like some of the rap I like when I was a kid, I'm like, it does kind of sound like drums and noise, you know, like that's what it was, but it was our drums and noise. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and it was a thing that like, I always, so many of the, like, cause you know, we came along, it was, a lot of our fans and listeners were white kids who were just getting into hip hop because they started seeing people that look like them on stage and they're like, oh, now I'm part of this. Right. And they would always ask me like, when, how did, how did you get into rap? And it's like, I, I didn't, it wasn't like, there wasn't a moment where I was like, oh, what's, you know what I mean? Like, I think I'm going to get into rap. That's, that's me. It's just like, this is (laughs) my generation. This is like, I didn't play football. My friends were not like, but even at that time, like even if you were in like black cultural spaces, rap wasn't like if people were going to college and joining fraternities and playing sports and getting good grades, they didn't listen to rap like that. They were listening. To yeah. R&B. Yeah. They yeah. were listening to like Keith Sweat and all that kind of stuff. And the people that were listening to rap right. and, and there was right. rap that was like kind of for them. You know what I mean? Like Heavy D or things like that. Yeah, like your Houdinis and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Because it was it was a little more R&B. There was like a sense of just like, no, this is naturally either you're, you are an upper class church going family or you listen to rap music. But there wasn't a, it wasn't a choice. It wasn't like, oh, I could get into uh, Dungeons and Dragons or I could get into this or I could get into rap music. Like it was just such a such a normal thing for anybody that was attached to that culture, but for anybody outside of it, they're just like fascinated by those stories of like, how did you get into rap? It was just something for the kids. I think like, like when, when breaking really got hot and, and, um, and bopping and pop locking all that stuff, like it just, you could, I mean, at least where I was, it was just anything. That's all we were doing. We were doing that and playing basketball, you know, and that was it. And, you know, we did used to actually walk around with a big radio, you know, imposing our music on everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was what it was, yeah. you know? And it was it was it was an act of defiance. We were writing graffiti and, and I don't know if it was meant to be that, it's just what it was, you know. We talk all the time about being independent, and a lot of times when you say that you're independent, especially if you're in a media space or an entertainment space, people just read that as being like, oh, you're broke. And if it was really that tight, if it was really that valuable, if it was really cracking, then you would have sponsors and you would have people putting money behind what you're doing, and you wouldn't have to ask me for my money. There's this thing about religious organizations and about movements and about grassroots stuff that some people have this feeling that if this was really that great, if you were really good at what you're doing, if it was really important, you wouldn't need to be asking me for money. But I was thinking recently about the fact that so many of the things that I came up really loving were sponsored by people. You know, when you, when you grew up on uh, public television, for example, just one example, all of the, that dope stuff that we came up watching as children they would have these drives where they would say, yo, if we let the sponsors start to drive this thing, if we start letting these big corporate sponsors pay our bills and cut the checks, and if we become part of you know, commercial radio and commercial television, then it's going to change the focus. And in order for us to keep the focus based on what we want it to be on, so I mean, the early hip-hop radio shows, we're all on public community radio. 
You know what I'm saying? They were on college radio. They were on community radio, stuff that was that was sponsored by the community. And the same with a lot of early television and films and the things that were really formative for us uh, as as kids um, growing into being the people that we are because it was based on education. It was based on putting a message forward that was good for us. And the corporations, a lot of times that's just not where their heart is and it's not what they like to put their money behind. Because anytime you do something that is uh, really focused and intentional about contributing to the best of who we are, that's not always a safe bet for corporations. And it's, I just was just hearing somebody basically say that a corporation in America is considered an individual, it's considered a person. And also, a corporation's sole job is to make money and to look out for its own self-interest and never mind what in, what's good for anybody else or good for society. So if a corporation is a person, a corporation is a sociopath and a psychopath, like the, with no care or concern for anybody but self, you know what I'm saying? And these are, the, these are oftentimes the ones that come in and sponsor the things that we care about. And so we wonder, like, why does culture go in a certain direction? Why does it seem that this hip hop music that we love, we're celebrating 50 years of hip hop, how come it started out with such a variety of voices, you know what I'm saying, and, and images? And why did it get so narrow that it's just got to be about, I mean, not only sex, but like violent sex, you know what I'm saying? And not only about lived life, but I mean about murder and about, you know, just the lowest common denominator, that's the involvement of corporations. And once they start to write the checks and once they start to pay the bills, they become the directors of the, of the content. It just is that way, you know? And so we've been independent from the very beginning, both in music and also in this podcast. So if you go to brotherali.com in the join section, you can get down with what we call the caravan. The caravan is the people that really support this work. Uh, there's a $5 level where you can jump in there and we have what we're building, uh, which is our own streaming service with rare and exclusive content, music, videos, talks, speeches, uh, podcast content, all of this stuff that we put up there that's not for everybody. This is just for the people that really rock with us. And then the upper level is $100 a month, which is a lot, but that's a real community. Those are the people that are really building with me and also with each other on a daily basis with a private Slack channel and these Zoom conversations that we do. Also, when we drop new things, we normally gift it to those people. You know what I'm saying? So if we have a new exclusive piece of vinyl that comes out, you know, very rare exclusive vinyl or learning series and things like that, we usually tend to gift those things to the people that are in that top tier. So head to brotherali.com in the join section or brotherali.com slash join and really consider being one of the sponsors, one of the patrons, one of the people who is contributing to what we want to see in culture, which is talking to each other, bonding with each other, connecting with each other based on our common humanity, based on the common good, based on trying to really foster a culture of human beings seeking to understand each other uh, instead of argue and tear each other down and gossip about each other and show each other in our worst picture, but to really look at a human being in the fullness of who we are, which really focuses on our shared humanity and our shared beauty. And we appreciate all of you for supporting this thing that we're doing. Did you have, like, when was the first time that you ever had, like, an older person that actually knew how to make hip-hop records? Like, when did you ever have somebody that that showed you, like, how to do it? I, I felt like the first year or two I was making beats, I didn't have anybody around me that was showing me how to make mm. beats. So I was doing all kind of things crazy, you know? Um, I ended up meeting Supreme, and he was the first person I saw that had, you know, like, I went to a studio where it's like, oh, they got these big reels and... You know, oh, that's the SP-1200, which could have been whatever the most coveted thing in the world to me at that point, because all the rappers were rapping about it. And I thought like, oh, if I just get an SP-1200, then I'm going to be dope. You know, and it just, and then I got to fool around with his stuff. And he 
he was a record champion. He had every record. I had, you know, all this kinds of stuff I didn't. So it was really probably like Supreme, but I, I don't feel like on a beat making level, he, I didn't learn that much from him because he wasn't that deep into it. He made beats, but records was really his thing. You know, mm-hmm. that's what he was like singularly focused on. Mm-hmm. But yeah, scrap. I went to like a studio with him and scratched on a record. Um, and I think that ended up being like on the wire or something weird. Um, like that that song was by this group called Four Fifths. Um, but yeah, the first first couple of years I was making beats on my own and just playing it for my friends. And like, that's all I just wanted to do. I just wanted to make beats. I didn't have a sequencer. I was using like the internal sequencer in this uh, rack mount sampler called the Emacs. Mm. And, uh, you know, that was the first time somebody bought a beat from me and stuff. And with that, I bought a sequencer and... You know, then I started hanging out. I, re- I ran into Vita one day at like this record store and gave him a ride home. And I just hung out with him that day. And I feel like we just hung out all the time after that. So then he was the one I'd be like, but man, how do you make it do this? Or I would just watch him put a song together. And I'm like, damn, because he could already kind of play because, you know, he had the he had the background with the, his dad being in a band. He just he had such a better feel for all these things that I did at that point. I remember one day I was like, man, I want to play bass lines on my stuff, but I don't, I don't know what notes to choose. And he's like, just play the high octaves and you can hear it. He's like, you'll be able to catch it. And I was like, oh, you know, and then I started finding the key and then I'm playing bass lines. It'd always be stuff like that. And then when we both started having the ASR tune, we started sharing, uh, sharing secrets, you know, yeah. of like different methods and stuff. We didn't have YouTube in those days. You had to actually know somebody, right? Yeah, there's something magical about the ASR10, man. My whole career has been made on the ASR10. Right. Like all the ants, all the ants beats, all the beats that we d- I did with you, and then with evidence. Like it's it, yeah. the, my whole career is on the ASR10. I didn't even think about the F thing too. Yeah. No, it's a, um, I think it's something about that machine that ties the sounds together in a way that just makes it sit right. Um, and on the computer, you got to do a little more work to like have the sounds mesh mm-hmm. in that way. And it kind of just does it for you naturally. And I also think that sequencer not really working that great made a lot of us that used it create our own style. You know, like, like the beats I was making on it did not sound like Nazis beats. Even though I was like trying to figure out how to make my beats sound like him so bad, you know, I'm like, damn, how, do, how is he doing this, you know? Um, or Timberland, or the Neptunes, or Kanye. All, it, all these people's beats sounded different. Alchemist's beats on, on the ASR sounded different than mine, um, for whatever reason. Um, I think because it didn't do all the work for you, you know? Like, so you kind of, your brain had to be in there somewhere. <laughs> um, and we and we all kind of found our own ways around the limitations of it, you know? And developed our own styles. It's amazing to me that people still would separate those sounds because like when they play all together especially if you like if you put a compressor on the master that's when it sounds good it's just yeah. um, like there's no mix I, like man all the great mixers in the world all the great engineers in the world nothing sounds like that you put that that compressor on the on the master but thing on the ASR man there's just something about like man for a long time I tried to make beats and you know this but like I, I never had all the right equipment all at the same time and then finally, I just was like, you know what? Right. I just need to sample vinyl into an ASR-10. Like, if that's how you're starting, then you're. it sounds like beautiful, like lush. You already had a leg up. Yeah. You just had a leg up with that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. Like, I, I had my, like, I had EQ set up, like, the certain way. I just never moved them. I remember um, Sam, Sam Wish, when he first started learning under me, came over to the studio one day. And he was like, He's like, why do you have the EQ set up that way? I was like, I don't know. It's just been that way. I never changed it. <laughs> and it wasn't like a, a thought I had. It wasn't like, oh, I got to dial in this hertz. Like, I'll be in the studio and somebody like, take the six hertz off. I'm like, I don't know what that is. I just turned the knob until it sounds good. Yeah. Um, and once it did, I never moved it, you know, and I was, then that became my sound for that period of time. Also, with the ASR, like, it, you can't do like 84 point whatever BPM. So everybody that uses the ASR, they all give you their beats in double time BPM, trying to get that half. You know what I'm saying? Right. 
when I when I started seeing what it, how the NPC sequencer worked, I'm like, oh man, I see why these guys could do some of these things I couldn't quite right, do right. on mine, you know, with with some of the triplets and you know, getting the in between kicks and stuff, the ghost notes, just was way harder to pull that off on the ASR. Um, for whatever reason, just the limitations of the sequencer. Yeah, and you start seeing why Raekwon's loop, I mean, why uh, RZA's loops sound like they do. You know what I mean? Because that ASR is just, it's not going to get it perfect. It's not going to do it for you. So, like, you got to have workarounds where you got to start, like, start your loop on a snare and have it go around that way so it doesn't cut off on the kick, you know? Like, it's just all these weird things we, we were making beats. And I started making beats in, like, five bars and six bars. And I was I was making beats in weird counts just to entertain myself. And then I would get, like, a call, like, yo, I don't even know. I remember Kendrick called me one time I was like, where's the one on this beat? And I was like, I don't even really know. I was like, wherever you want it to be, you know, like, but it was, it was another one of these like five bar beats that I probably started like halfway through where the one theoretically would be Yeah, because the SR wouldn't loop it on the one. Right. You know? Yeah. The one that you had with, with uh, Jay-Z and Dre and, and uh, Rick Ross. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's like a five or six bar beat, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, man. Like, and that it, it was it wasn't like I was out to be like, yo, I'm about to make a six bar beat. It just like that's what the sample called for, right? And so that's how I made it. Um I think Nipsey Ben Down was kind of like that. Is is those ones where you could kind of fit like a little intro thing and then repeat like one phase and then go back to the intro seamlessly. Then you can kind of make it whatever count you want to. And it makes dudes rap different. That's the part I liked about it, is it made dudes come with a different style. Yeah, um, you have to break routines. It wasn't just a linear. You got it's almost like shit. traveling. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like when you travel, you got to break your routines and you start finding out who you are in different situations. You get on a five bar loop, like because <laughs> I'm saying, especially for songwriters, like for people that just write bars. I'm, I'm you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, who a lot of those guys aren't thinking about it. Right. But people that write songs, we know that like we want to write in four bar pieces because it's always going to sound good to the ear. But you, right. you, somebody give you a five right. bar beat, a six bar beat, like man, <laughs> you've got to start. Dude, freeway adapts to those things so beautifully, man. It's it's weird because you know we've been work we've been working on uh, uh, doing stimulus I package heard it. too. You played like, it for me. We got we got some joints, pretty good. Crazy. Man. I'm, I'm excited. Crazy. So thank you, thank you, man. But like so, you know, I had him come out here. We were doing stuff. You know, I'd send him stuff, but I needed to be in there with him to be like, "No, this is what I want from you for this." You know, like more than anything, because he he can kind of do everything pretty well. But I feel like what we're doing, we need it needs to be his particular thing. Um, but I I noticed like with him, he raps really, he raps better on stuff with sixteen hi hats for some reason. I think because he he follows that, and that's where you start getting his. The rapid fire stuff, and if it's it's a beat with too much space, it's not really good for him for some reason. If you listen to all the joints he had, they always had like percussion stuff that he was following. I never had thought about that until like maybe when he was out here like four or five months ago. So then I started feeding him that stuff. I was like, okay, yeah, we got it. This is what yeah, we want. that's true. You think like Nine Hundred Hustler had all sorts of like toms and drum rolls and he was rapping to all that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah, man. Yeah, and then even what we do is like. It's the drums aren't doing, but there's so much going on in it's the a sample. Sixteen count. Yeah, there's so much going on in that. The high, the high is still doing that sixteen. Yeah, you know, and and that's it's weird. Like some like some like somebody like Rock will be like Rock Marsh will be like, nah, don't be don't be putting none of that on there, just because he wants the freedom to rap right. how he wants to rap and then not be off beat, right? That's the entire thing with him. That's what people don't get. Mm. When he when he started doing that and made that a thing, he wasn't the first dude to like do beats with no drums. Like, be clear, like lots of people did that, right? But he made it his thing, right? And it was like, it's just funny. Like, I would have never thought like that would turn into the thing in the underground. But maybe, maybe like underground is just so meant to not compete with the mainstream stuff. It was also that too. They'd be like. Now I want my shit to sound so drastically different than what these other guys are doing. It's popular that you occupy that space. You know, I feel like in our era of underground, we still want it to be popular. <laughs> so 
you know, we wanted to make a beat that was going to compete with uh, whatever the hot record. Well, that's because we had time, dilated peoples. You know? you know what I'm saying? Doing Kanye West and like Talib Kweli or somebody would have right. a thing, and like yeah. they they would be on or like Al, Al the, doing the, like the, a we gonna make it, yeah, on the yeah, radio. Man. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying it, and the, they would be on like the biggest festivals. Yeah, man, you could really do it like a straight up right. hip hop anthem that would become a major like mainstream thing and you could still be authentic and be real and still do that whereas like man that that went away very quickly well once once the the trap thing came in it kind of was just like you kind of had to have that to make a mainstream hit for the most part or or just real melody in there which I don't know, man. When we just get to like real rapidy rapping, rapping, I just don't want to hear nobody singing on that shit. It just sounds weird. I don't know. I don't know if that's like the hip hop purist in me, but like, I don't really like, like when, you know, once, once something like Give By came out or, um, you know, there would be ones where they did it so good that everybody was like, I can get one of those. Right. Or, you know, it just, everybody can't do that. That's, a, that's an anomaly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. So they they would be like, oh, we're just gonna get a hook from you know insert R and B singer, and now it's a, a radio banger. Nah, not really. It just is an awkward. Feeling, it's it's right? very rare that it works. It's just very rare, right? So so this underground era of the last like ten years has been like excessively like minimalist. Like dudes are like, yeah. I mean, I I got I didn't get an argument, but like I was talking to like some kids online, and they were like. You know, the, sometimes the drums just kill the vibe. And I'm like, but it's because you don't know how to program drums subtly. It don't got to be. It, have some subtle lead to your shit. Throw something else in there. It don't got to be the loudest snare ever. It doesn't even need to be that much of it. But it is possible. You can't just be like, nah, we're not doing drums because that's not the vibe. It's, what are you even doing then? Like, you're literally just taking records off. It's YouTube. funny because I feel like for a long time, your drums, like I would hear your drums on stuff and and I think that you probably did it. And then I realized it's just people with your drum sounds. Right. And then... Using a snare Jordan, yeah, yeah. But that, I, but that was a, a certain period where the drums had to be smacking. I remember somebody was, uh, what's Eminem's dude's name? Rosenberg, Paul, Peter, Paul Rosenberg. Paul, Paul. Yeah, yeah. yeah Paul. They were, and 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 he was like, man, people send us beats for Eminem, and the beats are fire, and like the musical part, and then the drums come in, and he's like, man, I just want to tell him like, go buy Jake One's drums and replace the sounds because they had to snap during that period. <laughs> But then there was a period where, like, no, it's like, man, Derringer found the sweet spot. Like when Derringer's drum packs came out, it's those right. like filth drum packs. I know because I've 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 heard them in your joints too. That's actually Beat, Beat Butcher. Butcher. Beat, that's sorry, not even yeah, Derringer. Beat Butcher. Yeah, so Beat Butcher. Yeah, yeah. Beat Butcher made the best drum packs I had heard. Where I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna use these. I mean, I didn't earn my stripes with drums. I had everybody else using my shit. So I was like, man, I'm gonna use your shit. Yeah. You know, and I man. It's, I, I'll pull those out. Like I'm always gonna do something to make it my own, though. I feel like I can't just import something and just be like, "Done." That's me. It just feels weird to me because that's just not the aesthetic we come from. Yeah, it's something that another producer straight programmed. Like, nah, this got to. There's got to be a some kind of flip, especially yeah, especially like their breaks. It's one thing to mess with those sounds, but to just pull the break in is that's not working. I mean, they're selling MIDI. MIDI programs now. It's like it's it's all possible. You know what I mean? Dudes are selling drum MIDI programs. <laughs> and then you just import your own sounds. It's, it's nuts. Selling those like sample packs with like full on played stuff. It seems like you and Coop mm -hmm. were foundational in that. Yeah. Like maybe you didn't what was what what was you and Coop's role? We were in early. Yeah. We were really early on that. I was doing this because I just got tired of getting like in trouble for samples, them taking all my money, all these various things, right? Like, like I'll, I'll give you an example, like De La Soul, Rock Cocaine Flow. I mean, if you know the sample, I didn't just loop the damn record. Not even close, all, right? It's, yeah. It's... So it, do, it doesn't really seem to matter what you do or how you use the record, they're gonna just slaughter you. So like that one, I think the sample took 90%. And it's like of the 100%. So I think I have 3% of the publishing on that song. And that's just not fair. So. At a certain point, we're like, cool, we'll make our own shit, right? So then I met Coop when I lived in the Bay. He was like the best I had ever heard at like vintage sound, just what he was into. It was just, I never heard anybody that cared about, you got to use this cloud with this mic and all this stuff. 
And I was making those for myself to sample. Like uh, some of the songs on White Van Music, like Trapdoor, Room Have Doom, that's all live stuff to Coop that I had in play. And then I resampled it and made my own beat. Um, so fast forward to like 2014, 15, when it was really like this dude, Nick Brongers, who we used on um, Only Life I Know, right? On your album. Oh, mm -hmm. um, he was the first guy that I heard of like, making, you know, quote unquote samples, like, I'm going to give you this and you just put your drums on it. And at the time I was like, but well, what am I, that's like, what am I doing? I got to make it my thing. You know what I mean? Just the ego, producer ego mm -hmm. was like, you know, doing that. And it just made me be, and then so Frank Dukes was also like my little homie at the time. And he really followed Nick Bronger's. And then he, what, the way he thought about it, which was fucking genius, was that, if I make all these pieces of music and to give them to all these producers, I got like a hundred producers working for me. And then I have a hundred more opportunities to get on these records. So being that me and Coop are already doing this, I was like, all right, let's put a pack out. Um, but before we even put the pack out, I happened to be at Interscope one day and I met Southside, who was, you know, one of these inventors of the trap. You know, he worked on all the early Waka stuff and, uh, my homie, who was kind of, you know, his manager at the time was like, yo, you should give him some of your stuff you're doing, but without drums. And I, I remember at the time being like, I'm like, but I'm the drum dude. Like, why would I even do that? I thought it was weird. So I give him 10 samples. And out of that, maybe a month later, we got a song on Dirty Sprite 2 Future, which is considered a classic. I mean, we made something that that's going down in history. So we we did. I did some with G Coop. I started doing it myself. I started getting better at playing. I did some with Sam Wish. Um, and it was just rolling, man. I had more commercial success than I ever had in my life with that stuff, which is so funny because I wasn't looking for it, right? Like, it's not like I wasn't listening to the future, like, how can I get part of this? It just happened. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And now that's like the portal to every kid's. Man, I have literally like 50 kids trying to send me, you know, samples or loops every day. <laughs> And every once in a while, you hear someone be like, yo, this dude's special. Mm. And even just the baseline, people are kind of good at this point at this. That like, you know, some of the older artists like that, that were taking all that publishing, they've had to come back and lower their prices of what they want. Because we were like, yo, we don't need you. We created our own thing. You know? I remember for a while, you had to connect at like Stax Records. Like there was a while where people were giving you and a few oh, yeah, other producers yeah. like the... The original st yeah. uh, stems and yeah. sessions Multi -tracks. and like all that stuff. Is that still something that is it for people sure. still do that? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I I have a admin deal with Warner Chapel, and I'm always trying to get stuff from them. That's like my main focus in life. I, I'll get them, and I'm like, I just sit there like like I got um, baby Huey hard times, and I'm just like, you got that one. Oh my crazy. god, the, the flute, crazy man. You know, I mean that's it's. I think just being like a collector and being record guy, equipment guy, the, the next phase of like exclusivity is multi-tracks. Yeah. And it's gone kind of crazy where too many people are having them. It started, people start sharing stuff. So I had to like just go insular and be like, Nah, I, I source these. These are mine. I'm not giving them to nobody. Yeah, I remember you used to give people thumb drives. Like you would give other produ producers, like we would see other producers and you well, would just give the them Well, because the stack stuff, they were trying to get it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because the stack stuff, they wanted that out there. And, you know, there's joints that happen because of that. Like uh, the song Al did on um, Kendrick's album, Fear. Does that sound right? On the, uh, Tell me about the damn album. That was oh, something okay. I gave him that was 24. 24 karat black i gave him that session and he used it and he cleared it and he, he did well on it so like that was the whole purpose that beat can't be made without the stems right. and i will say when i got that i think it just pushed me to the next level of being as a producer i i, I utilize those in a way that every me and vitamin i would say were utilizing those in a way that everybody else wasn't um because i think most people are like yeah, cool. I got it without the drums now. I'm just going to like put my drums on it. That wasn't what we were thinking. I was like, I'm going to take the, the chords from this one, chop the flute from this one, the wah wah from this. Like, I was looking at how I was already making stuff with G Coop's music that I had him play. And that was just part of my palette. Yeah. You know? One of the things that I've noticed about you, man, is that you're so generous. First of all, with your inspiration. Like, I remember when you did the Drake beat, 
or no, uh, I'm trying to remember. It was like one of the one of the gospel beats early on that you got a lot of love for. You mm-hmm. were like, "Yeah, I got inspired because Just Blaze made one." Like just Blaze brought back the the gospel yeah, joint, yeah, so yeah, I so I decided sure. I would do it. Like you're very generous with that, and then also you make videos where you show people literally your individual tracks for how you did everything, the st- how right. you get the stems out of stuff, how you uh, you know using the Serato yeah. studio to get the stems out, using Melodyme to repitch things, right? Like literally giving, and then like yeah, like me and you would be traveling, and you would see. Uh, like knots or somebody and be like, yo, here's all the new stacks things that I got. Just literally. Right. And even before you were selling the packs, like you were giving them. I remember you being like, yeah, here's the, uh, somebody right. would be like, oh, I like men of drums on so-and-so were crazy. And you're like, yeah, give me your email. You still got the same email. I should, I just send it to you. Like just sending people your drum stems right. and everything, man. Like you've always been right. incredibly generous with all of that. Well, I, th- I think I had a good role model in Vitamin because mm-hmm. he did that for me. And, you know, Supreme took me around and you have to and let me get records. So I just, I, it's just a community of people and we all, we all on the same thing. And to me, it's like, I get a kick out of just like having the new thing, you know what I mean? And having a technique. And sometimes I can't even show what I'm doing because I'm like, oh, yeah, they don't need to know about that. Let's, let's keep that tough. But, um, it's with the B video specifically. I really did that to sell Snare Jordan. Right. Yeah, I remember that. And then I would say after I did him, I was like, I saw the reaction and it, it I didn't realize I was branding myself and let you know, because I'm not out here shouting from the mountaintops my discography. I don't, you know, I don't feel like I don't need to do that, right? Like if you know, you know. But um as I meet younger guys over these last 10 years I'm doing them, they're always like, people I would never think are even into the kind of music I do. They're like, yo, your videos, it's the best. Like, I, I took this and like, there's a dude that um, I met named Dao, who is like an incredible sample maker. And he told me he started making samples because he watched the Drake mm. video and how we remade the sample on that. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Because there's definitely times I feel like people will play me a beat. They'd be like, yo, you inspired this. And I'm like, Damn, this is terrible. Like I feel, <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed that I helped you create that. Oh, you know man, what I mean? Yeah, I so like, there are some wins where you're like, <laughs> you know, when somebody's really good like that, it 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 just makes me feel like I did my part in further in this thing. You know, like it's not it's it's not all gonna be about me. You know, it's like just the nature of it. I think as the older I've getting, I've just appreciated that I'm still allowed to do this and have people care because it just there is an expiration date on. Um, being impactful in this thing. I mean, I've had an incredibly long run at this point. So I think I've just been embracing all that, you know, at this point. But even from the beginning, it's just that community. I, it's it's people I looked up to, like Knotts. I got so much just from listening to him. I didn't, he didn't have to show me how to do nothing. I, just me hearing his beats did so much for me, you know? And a lot, it's a lot of that with like, you know, sharing sounds and stuff like that. Just like, Yo, I feel like I owe you some because I got so much just as a listener from you, you know, and I might have took a technique from him. Knotts is, I think, one of those, the, the, when you talk about, I mean, he's got amazing credits. Like, man, he's got all kind of platinum joints. He's got cultural moments. He's got classics. He's got everything. Still with all of that, I feel like Nas is one of the most under, like, credited, you know what I'm saying? In terms of, like, just. He's, su- he's super underrated, underrated man. Yeah. Like. Like who who's 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 better than that dude, man? In terms of his ability to flip samples, to play stuff, but then like man, the way he the way he can flip a bass line on something, right? I think he's probably the best like producer that in terms of like adding a adding bass lines, man. I think he's the best that's ever done that. Well, you know, you know, his thing is that he can take any sample and make a dope version of a knots beat with it. It just doesn't even like. Because I feel like a lot of us are like, we're re- the sample is reliant. We're reliant on the sample being some degree of quality that makes, you know, like the hallmark of the beat is that. The sample is just kind of like a little part of most of his beats. It's really his drum program and him playing bass and just how hard it is hitting, you know, and just that that aggression, man. As far as bangers, he's, he's one of the best ever. I, man... I had a beat tape of his, I don't know, it was a long time ago that I used to listen to all the time. I'd just be like, 
And I would hear these things and be like, damn, he's not even selling all these. How do I have a chance? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if he can't sell every one of these beats, how am I going to sell a single beat out here? You know? Yeah. What was the, um, like, are there other producers that that are under, like, that are in your, like, top, like, favorite producers that people, because everybody says the same people all the time. Everybody says Dilla and, the and Premier and P-Rock yeah. and, you know. But who who are, like, other right, other right. ones that... that um, I mean, for me, I think Battle Cat, um, something about maybe just being from the West Coast. He just, he just has a thing that's just unmistakably him, you know, like you can, he's another guy. You just give him any piece of music. He's going to make a Battle Cat version of it. Um, I know when I went on to do Tuxedo, he's a huge inspiration. That's why I always try to put him on every record we do. Cause I'm like, you helped create this, you know? And I knew when I made it and he liked it, I was like, that's that's who I made it for, you know. Him and the the disco guys that influenced me. Like, I don't really care what nobody else says. Everybody else likes it. That's great too. But like, that's like I'm trying to honor that, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, there's man, there's so many guys that that I got a lot from um, over the years, and and not you know, not the most famous ones. D, I mean, DJ Khalil for sure. I mean, he's one of my best friends. So like. We talk every day. Um, we've just had the same experience in career, right? He's still going and I'm still going, but we both got our first big like multi-platinum thing with um with G Unit. And that's 2003, right? So this is 20 years later, and we're still getting getting on albums, which is crazy. Um yeah, there's there's a lot of dudes. I mean, vitamin D, obviously. Um it's it's weird because I think there's a there's like a there's now a thing where it's like being a dope producer and making dope beats is a totally different thing than like, do you have a dope discography, right? Mm-hmm. And there's some people I don't think like their technique isn't something I all the way admire, but I just love the songs they make. You know what I mean? And as I've gotten older, I feel like I'm more am a discography person because I just feel like it's a lot of people can make a dope beat, you know, like it's we're just in a place where that is easier and easier to do. I mean, there's there's dudes on Instagram every day. I hear a beat. I'm like, it's a pretty dope beat, you know. But like, where's the record? You know, where's the song? Where's this gonna make other people make a beat like that? You know, it's it's crazy. Like to not only make incredible beats, make incredible songs, but then to just be to to create the soundscape for a cultural moment, like in hip hop culture, not in some, you know, what I'm saying, <laughs> not in some offshoot scene. But I remember seeing when uh, when when Dove passed away, yeah, and they had like the big celebration and like uh, it was all like all of the greatest dudes and all my favorite people on one stage, yeah. And Dave Chappelle was there and they're like celebrating De La's discography, right? And I'm watching it. I was in Mecca actually when this happened, but I was watching on, online and they did a countdown. And I'm like, what beat? What are they gonna drop on the countdown? I'm thinking maybe me, myself, and I, or something like that. And they threw on Rock Cocaine Flow, man. Like, right, right. Yeah, I cried like for you. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. When that, when that moment. Damn. I mean, yeah. that that's. And Dante Ross was like, man, I wish I would have held my book so that I could have put that night and that moment. He was like, I wish, I wish I could have ended my my autobiography like that. Wow. Yeah, it's it's just it's one of those like. I mean, I guess when you get 20 years away from something, it's just like, and it's still, people still care. You, you did it, you know, like it's hard to do. Um, them being one of my favorite groups, even one of the reasons I even was sampling in the first place, because I remember getting De La Soul is Dead. And I was, I think the first record I remember seeing, like they sampled Edna Wright. And I was like, damn, what's Edna Wright? And then I was just on a mission to find that record. And it just, it brought me, you know, brought me into the crate crate thing and that's such a huge part of who i am so that I made that song for them is just nuts I, i've had i'm having a weird experience with like when people that I, that I'm, i've done songs for pass and then it turns into this other thing it feels kind of nasty to me i don't i don't i mean i'm happy about it I'm, I'm happy in a way that like people are appreciating their music um because i feel this way about doom and nip as well who obviously i worked a lot with both of them I just I don't know if it, it feels it feels tainted to me because they're not here. Um, yeah. Which that's just my own feeling. I don't think everybody else should feel that way. It's just me, right? Like when Nip, when that when this thing happened with Nip when he died, I just was like, this is crazy, man. Like 
because living it when it was happening, it was a big thing, but it wasn't that. So right. like it, it feels unfair that he didn't get to experience it. You know what I mean? And to a degree, it's the same with Doom. I mean, you know, like I don't, I think his music was going to keep going forever regardless because he just did so much outstanding music and another unique character, right? That's the whole point. Um, but like I'll drive around Seattle and they they paint these electrical boxes of, uh, you know, people of the past. And so I'll drive to the golf course, I'll see John and I'll see Nip. And I'm like, this is just, I, I really knew these guys, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and... I, yeah, I don't know. It, it just it just kind of makes me sad. Um, but also, I guess you know the the positive is that I made something that is going to go on forever with them. When I die, I guess people will be playing them songs excited too, which is great. <laughs> You're the one that introduced me to Mac Miller, and you were clowning him so hard, like you wouldn't you didn't give that guy a moment's rest. Man. Yeah. You used to call him Max yeah. Miller. I know, man. <laughs> I know, man. You know, this is just like I think, I think being an early white person in hip hop, we we face that, right? So like, it probably was something in me. I just thought like it was too easy for some of these guys because they didn't, they didn't face you know the uphill battle. It was not. I mean, it's it's the only thing I probably could have done in the world that I was the minority, right? Like being hip hop as a white person when I came along. Um, so when they kind of became like, and you know what's really dope about Mac Miller, I will say, really dope. He knew all that, and he worked so hard to help other dudes that didn't have the shot right, yes. that he did. He had people yes. recording in his house. He's he's a big part of a lot of guys' careers that he didn't have to do none of that. Um, so, I mean, another part of it with him is he's just, he was just so young, man. We were like full ass adults, man. He was like 18 years old. I'm probably like 38. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, I, I, remember. I did see him. Mm. I did. I saw him last time I saw him before he passed was at Alchemist's house and he was recording this song with Migos that day. So I got to, I had, I had a good, good conversation with him that day. And he even brought up that day. Like, it's like, man, you know, it's crazy. You guys even asked me to play my music. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at your studio, he was like, man, but he was even still remember that. It was crazy to me because this dude had, you know, he had he had the world in his hands, obviously. You know what I mean? So it's, an, it's just a tragedy, man. Like it's crazy that dude's gone. Like he he came out, he did the rare like thing, like a Timberlake kind of thing, where you looked at it's kind of like not seriously taken by the culture. And then you actually became somebody that we look to, like, yo, you're dope. Yeah. That is really hard to pull off when you start off not being looked at that way. Yeah. You know? So, like, you know, I can't do nothing but just respect what he did in, in his journey. Um, you know, we weren't like best friends or nothing. I, I don't I don't like this is another thing when people die. I don't like when people play up their thing with whoever it is, right? Like, like when Mac Miller died, I wasn't like, let me find a picture with Mac Miller. That's not my first reaction. You know right. I mean? Yeah, people make it about um, themselves. It's just more like, damn, he's gone, you know? Right. I'm like, Dave died. It's just it's just sad. I'm thinking about Poss and Mace because I know what that was, you know? Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's not like, let me find my picture with Dave. Like, I don't know. It just, this this is this is me just, you know, I don't, I don't know why I feel that way, but I do. <laughs> yeah. What is um? You've also had relationships with people that I didn't. That when I look at them as an outsider, I can't imagine anybody having a relationship with them, like Drake. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like, what is, what 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 is it to know that dude? Like, what's and to work with him and to, like, what it what is that? I can't imagine that. Yeah, it's it's been a minute since I talked to him, but um, man, I, I will say like Drake is just. He's Canadian nice, man. He's just a nice guy. I mean, I think clearly he's shown you over these last 10 years, if you want to cross him, he got that for you too <laughs> with the rapping. But I don't know, man. He he hit me up on Twitter. That's how I met him and, you know, brought me out to the Ovo Fest. He didn't have to do that. You know, I, I was just sitting there like around all these celebrities. I'm like, how, why am I here? This is, <laughs> this is strange, but um, super cool dude. Um, comes from the same place we come from in a lot of ways, you know, as far as musically, 
you know, he looks at those same things. That's what initially inspired him, you know, the, the 90s rap stuff. He was a kid when that happened. So, I mean, I think what he's done is an unprecedented thing, just period. There's never been anybody this popular for this long, you know, rap, maybe in any kind of music. I mean, mm. it just, you know, we're going on, this is a long period of time he has just dominated, you know what I mean? Absolutely dominated. Um, but, you know, I feel like the way I approach anybody that's on that level of stardom is just leave them the fuck alone. Personally, that's me. I'm going to like, if I got some music for you, I'm going to send it to you. Like Cole's the same way. I'm not like every day Cole does something cool. Yo, man, congratulations on your 100th platinum single or whatever it is. Just, just be real. You know what I mean? Be who you are and realize that their time is is coveted. So don't waste it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I remember one of the early things when we were talking when you when that when those things started to happen for you and like the really big artists were hitting you up. You were like, "Man, the beats that Drake wants are the same beats that MOP wants, and the same beats that Cole wants, and the same beats that Daylight wants. <laughs> like Fifty <laughs> wants the same beats Daylight wants. Like they're the same joints." Right, right. I I think that's what I, stro- I was striving for the whole time as a producer. Like I don't want to make a music. I don't want to make music that's just good for the most underground guy or the most popular guy because I don't really feel like I ride with any of them. I like what I like, and it's all over the place. It's not like you know, I'm not really cheering for nothing unless it's an underground person I know or something I have a financial invested in. Besides that, I just like what I like. You know what I mean and. I think the internet has made like a lot of music and metrics and all that stuff because it's so visual now. It's like sports teams where you're cheering on one side, so you're not supposed to like the other. And I don't really care about none of that shit. You know what I mean? Like personally, you know, um, there was definitely times like early on, like when I was with G and them, I'm like, damn, I kind of want to do a B for game, but that might look bad. But I think I don't even think that would have mattered, honestly. Like, it just, you know, I, I I like that I I can be cool with all these people, but I'm not beholden to them at the same time. You know what I mean? I'm not, like, in their everyday taking the punches with them. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, there's always, like, another thing coming, too. That's the crazy thing. I I, I don't usually see it for myself when it's coming, but... I've definitely been able to pivot and lean into it when it's working, you know. Is there anybody that you, because I remember for a long time, it was like the goal was to get to work with Ross. I remember when that was like, man, I got to I gotta work with this <laughs> yeah. Ross guy before he stops making this, this amazing music. You know what I mean? Like that was a big goal for a minute. Right. Do, do you have any of those that you haven't, that it haven't was, happened yet? It was. <sighs> Man, I'm not, I can't say I do, man. I mean, Charlie Wilson. I want Charlie Wilson on a tuxedo song. That's about it. Like, he's probably the last one. I'm sure there'll be somebody else that comes along. I don't know, man. You know, the older you get, you just don't have the same kind of... Um, you're not attached to these newer things because they don't occupy the same space in your life that stuff did when you were 16. And that's why I think whatever that part about, when whatever came out when you were a kid, you're just going to hold in a different... Totally different light. You know what I mean? Like I've been doing, I've been in this business so long and seen so many different things come and go. Um, I'm extremely skeptical because that's just the only way to survive doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm never going to be like, this one's going to change my life. Cause I I don't, you know, I've heard that too many times. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't know what the new thing is, man. I'm, I, I'm waiting for it. You know, I I do think we're kind of in a stagnant place and there'll be something that comes along that I'm sure is going to be like, oh, that's the shit, you know? Yeah. I mean, you you really do stay involved, though, because I know like you've put me onto a lot of newer music. Like I remember before NBA Youngboy was known, I remember you told me you were like, man, you got to hear this make no sense. <laughs> that damn make no sense. He only got oh, one song make no that sense. I like, but that song. Dude. <laughs> Like, man, that song still makes me feel like fighting somebody. Like, when I hear that song, I'm like, man, everybody better, there better be nobody in this elevator. Like, I listen to that when I'm getting ready and I'm like going out to a show. And I'm like, man, it better, (laughs) I love like, man, it better not be anybody in this, you know what I'm saying? Oh, man, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, some, every once in a while, there'll be one that hits me like that where I'm just like, oh, this is, you know, 
as as a producer, it's sad, but the stuff that I I look up to is the stuff I wish I would have made. That's the only stuff I really respect. Like, I'm like, damn, I wish I could have made that. This makes me feel whack, which is so stupid. Like, it shouldn't be the only way I enjoy music, but it is. Mm-hmm. Um, at least hip hop for sure. Um, so it, you know, as, as you do this long, long time. Yeah, there's, there's, I feel like there's all these different stages. I, I've, I've definitely been in stages like, oh, I'm over this. Some days, I mean, there's days right now I'm like, maybe I'm just gonna retire. I'm tired of doing this. And then I'll be like, I might make five beats one day. Like, it's just, it's just random. I just try to do it as I feel it. I really try not to let anything make this be a job for me. Like, just, it just, I'm fortunate to be in that position that I can treat it that way. But that's the only way that I feel I'm gonna make good music is to tap into that real joy that I have as a kid. Yeah. And it seems like you try to, it seems like most of the people that I know that do this for a long time, I mean, they make a lot of music. Most people made years of music before anybody else ever acknowledged them. Like most people, most people that I know that succeeded in this thing, they made five, you know, what Kanye said, five beats a, a day for six summers or something. But Fine. like they all did that. Yeah, they yeah. all did it for hella long before anybody ever acknowledged them. They all did it for a long time before they ever really saw any money. But then they also usually keep people around that inspire them. Like there's like there's like a commute. There's like even if right. it's just two or three people, it's like man, there are two or three people that they still mm-hmm. vibe with and that they still feel some inspiration mm-hmm. and like are able to still share moments with somebody that keep that keeps them going. Yeah, I think, you know, there's it, it, it's in different tiers because there's like my peers, you know, like a Vita or, um, you know, my other homies that I kind of care about. Some of them I don't care about their opinion necessarily. There's a couple of older guys like my boy Samson. If he tells me I'm doing good, then I feel like I'm doing good because he just was always hard to please when I first started making music. Um, and then, you know, there's like, the kids, like, which is somebody that's like 22. Like I have a homie of mine I grew up who has a son who's like a dope producer. So he comes through. And when he's hype about something I do, I'm like, okay, maybe this is, this is, this is something, you know what I mean? Because they're just coming at it from such a different place. I like to get that perspective because that's what, that's what the people are. It's not just only my peers, you know? And I just like seeing like what they're on, just the new yeah. techniques. You know, it's fun like putting a twenty-two year old up on. Like I played him Slum Village the other day, and he was just like, "It's like, yo, this is so dope." And he's like a church kid. You know, he can really play all that stuff. But like, he had never. I mean, why would he hear Slum Village? How would he know that? He's twenty-two years old. You know what I mean? So we take some of this for granted that that we have this crazy, vast amount of knowledge that we've been working at for forty years. You know. So it's cool to share that and and then mm-hmm. get something back from them, just seeing how they take it. Like, what what is he going to do with that? And I'm, I'm interested to see. You've made full albums with certain people. So like me and Free. Yeah. Who else have you made full albums with? I did a, I did a tape with this, uh, this kid, Travis Thompson, out of here this year. He's a younger-ish kid. Um, full album? No, not that many, man. Not that many. I mean, obviously, Tuxedo, I have to be there for that. Um yeah, not that many. I, I've been, you know, I, I don't like the commitment of having to be like fully responsible for it mm. in general. Like, um, and I don't know if that's good or bad. I think I probably should have been doing more of that, but I don't know. It just, I'm not really trying to sacrifice what my day to day life is to like be in the studio for 10 hours a day with somebody. I just don't enjoy it that much. Um, and the crazy thing is when COVID hit, I got back into making beats. So I wasn't having to go on the road. So I really got to lock in and that's just having my most successful year ever. And I'm like, without going to the studio. So that made me even be more like, and I ain't going to the studio. Like, get somebody else to record you. I'm not doing mm. that. Um, but like, you know, it has to be something I really care about, right? And a person I care about. More, more even than like what the music is. Like free, I just, you know, that's my brother. I love him. So... If we're gonna do this, I want to make it as good as possible. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's it's crazy that like you could not be around somebody for ten years. I mean, we see each other, we hang out once when I'm in his town or he's in my town, but like, it's like nothing ever changed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I'm, I'm grateful for that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I really appreciate that. We talk about therapy a lot on this podcast and it makes a lot of sense with what we talk about and what the themes are and what the intention is. But also, like a lot of podcasts, we have a partnership with BetterHelp. B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com is their website. And if you add to that, betterhelp.com slash travelers, it'll let you let them know that we sent you and it'll also... Uh, mean that you'll get a discount and we get a commission to help the work that we do here. And I was just talking to a friend of mine, um, a homie that I met through a business dealing. And over the past several years, you know, once we get on the phone and talk about business, we just kind of stay on the phone and like, how are you doing? And how's your family? And how are your kids? And what's going on with you? We started connecting during the pandemic. And so the past few years have been really formative for a lot of us. And I just was really talking to him about the fact that like, man, you seem to have really been working on yourself. I just feel you opening up and I feel you still struggling to find the words to describe what's going on inside of you. But I can really tell that you're doing the work to do that. Like, what's that look like for you? And I straight up asked him, have you been in therapy? And it's deep because he was like, you're right that I have been working on this stuff, but no, I haven't done therapy. And I asked him why. And he said, man, I don't know if I've ever thought about this directly, but he said, I've always had this image of therapy that if I were to talk to a therapist, somebody who's a trained professional, that they would have more experience and have really more power over me and my own thoughts than I would. I'd be handing over control of my mental state to somebody else. And it's deep. You know, my wife is also a therapist. And a lot of times she'll be having a conversation with someone that she meets and everything will be cool and flowing and nice. And then they'll say, well, like, you know, what are you doing? She'll say, oh, I'm a therapist. And suddenly they get defensive. They get quiet because it's like, no, you stay out of my brain. Stay out of my head. And it just really shows the misnomers and I think the misunderstanding, the, the false conception that we have about therapists and therapy, that we're going to be talking to some Sigmund Freud mastermind who knows us better than we know ourselves and can read our minds and read our thoughts and reach in there like a puppet master and start playing around with our emotions and things. That is not what therapy is like. Uh, in BetterHelp, you you go on the website, betterhelp.com slash travelers, and then they're like, oh, Brother Ali sent you. So you get a discount, and they send a little money to Travelers Media, and like, here, keep doing your podcast thing. But you tell them, what is it that's bringing me to therapy? So I do I want to talk about addiction or relationship issues or whatever it is. And then you go into, you know, is there a certain type of therapist you want to talk to? Do you want to talk to a man? Do you want to talk to a woman? Do you want to talk to somebody that has your gender identity or your uh, sexual orientation? Or do you want to talk to somebody that with your religious background or that's from your ethnic group? You can specify all that if you want to. I didn't do that when I first went to BetterHelp because I don't think I realized I could. And I wasn't even sure how to answer that stuff. I'm like, man, I just want to talk to a qualified licensed therapist who's just here to talk to me about me, who's just here to serve me. This is about me getting well. And I ended up with a woman from a different background. And man, it was profound. And then you go in their schedule. You choose the time. You choose if you want to turn the camera on or just talk on the phone. And I would say, talk to somebody and don't reveal anything until you feel comfortable. Just keep, stick to the basics and only share what you feel comfortable sharing. And if you never, after you try for a few weeks, and if you don't feel comfortable, then don't share anything with them. You can change your therapist on BetterHelp with just click of a button. It's no problem. I've done it. And I still, I started with somebody that I really loved. And then that person, she had to go back to in-person full-time care. And so she, she stopped doing better help. 
But man, I made tremendous progress with her and it was really incredible. And then since then, I've tried a few therapists and I'm still trying to lock in on somebody. But now I know what it feels like to talk to somebody who's just there to serve me and who's going to ask me questions that are really just, it's more so that I deserve to know what's going on inside there. And I have these narratives that I've always told myself. And so when I start to share those with somebody, they just ask questions that allow me to see things from a different perspective and just consider things in a different way. But this person has not tried to, you know, give me their conclusions or tried to re rewire me, you know. So head to betterhelp.com slash travelers and give therapy a chance. Just give it a try. And stay in your comfort zone until you're ready to step out of it. And just know that we don't have to be so reliant on our addictions and these crutches and these external things. It is possible for us to have more control and have more a sense of sovereignty and ownership of ourselves to know what's going on there. And it's a beautiful thing. So we're very grateful to have this partnership with BetterHelp.com slash travelers. Did you ever get to be there when like J. Cole or Kendrick or... Yeah. Because I'm saying like not only have you had really big records, but from the later times, like all of the greatest artists have recorded on your yeah. tracks. Like um, Nipsey. Yeah. I was there when Nipsey recorded multiple times. Um the funny thing with him is he was never like a dude that was like, yo, I want to rap. Like he just wanted to hear a bunch of music. Certain stuff would strike him and then he would come back to it, you know. But I, when we did the song Bend Down, he actually recorded um, maybe the first half of the verse when I was there. And I remember Mike from Mike and Keys was like, yo, never does this. He was like, this is rare, you know. And I even, I even took a video of him rapping that day and I, I cannot find it, of course. Um but I was there when they mixed Victory Lap for some of the days for that. So I got to see him add on to some songs and stuff like that. Um, Cole, it's more like he'll make something and send it to me and ask me my opinion on it or, you know, want some production changes. Um, he's he's just a one guy. Like another guy is like he is what he seems. He's He lives all of it. You know what I mean? Like, and I just respect that, that it's not none of this stuff is a facade for him. He's beyond generous so like um i definitely like i and, and here's another thing i think that happens when you start working with these kind of artists i think a lot of the producers feel like well i should be on every album it's like it ain't gonna be that way every time so i don't get mad at them when they don't use my beat on the album you know i'm more like man you put me on three different albums i can't complain so i just keep it cool Mm-hmm. Maybe the next one. Maybe I just didn't have the right thing for that album. You know what I mean? Um, but you yeah, mm-hmm. haven't been there that much for the younger guys. I never got to work with Ross because when I started working with him, tuxedo happened, so I was gone a lot. And I remember, <laughs> I remember like his A and R thought I was bullshitting him. You know, I'm like, I'm like, I have a show. I have like eight shows in the next two weeks. I can't go. You know, I got invited to like his birthday party one time, which. Come on, of course I should have went to that. That would have been amazing. Um, That'd be dope, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, we, we exchange, you know, we'll, we'll exchange messages and stuff. He's 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 just as hilarious as he is in, on the records. He's in character all the time. It's it's crazy. But yeah, I remember the A&R at that time was like, so yo, your, your group's kind of popping. He's like, I thought, you were, I thought you were lying. I thought you just didn't want to come. I'm like, no, I'm like actually doing this. I Believe me, I will be there. Um. Who have I been in the studio with? I mean, it's it's more like the producers. I was in there with Playboy Cardi for like when I worked on that album, and I was definitely one of the more puzzling experiences for me as an old head, where I was just like, "What is this?" Like, I I was so lost. Like, mm. and to see like you know four months later his album comes out and it's playing everywhere, and every kid is just. The joy, like when his music had came on that summer, just in any space I was in, how they started dancing around. I was like, that's hip hop. That's what you want to make people feel, right? And to have some small part in that was just hilarious to me. <laughs> I was like, I'm an old man. It even told us in the studio that day, 
me and the AR are like, yo, you guys are old. You guys don't even understand why this is dope. <laughs> he was right. He's totally right. <laughs> And it's not like I was like, nah, that was whack. I was just sitting there puzzled. It wasn't my place to be like, that's whack. I think for a lot of people, the seeing you do the tuxedo thing was like puzzling because it's so Hell different yeah. than it seems outwardly like like it's so different from the rap music you make. But what's interesting though is that Ant, most of the music that Ant is known for is like him sampling rock music with loud drums and it's dark and it's whatever. But then there's there's this one particular album that Ant that Slug and Merce did that Ant produced. It's uh, felt too, and it's all like player. It's all like SOS band sounding right. type of thing. And Ant always says that's the music that's most representative of who I am. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so when I saw you doing the tuxedo thing, you know the outfit was what it was, and like you know having the glasses and all that kind of stuff. But musically, to me, it made complete sense especially knowing that you and aunt have really similar ex like childhood and cultural experiences right they're like you guys grew up probably feeling the most amount of joy in your life at like a black family reunion or like <laughs> something where like where 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 like jimmy jam and terry lewis songs were like the 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 most joyful moments for sure you know what i'm saying sure was that something that was like, what was Mayor already trying to go that way or did that, was that come from you? What's, what's really random about that whole thing is, so 2006, I took lessons, no, 2005, I took lessons, um, piano lessons from P. Coop when I lived in Oakland. So I just got a rudimentary understanding of some chords and stuff. And, you know, I was making so much dark hip hop. I mean, that was like the thing I was doing at the time. Um, I always appreciate a lot of West Coast music, but I have the musical talent to do it. And I just started messing around mm -hmm. making those kind of tracks for just for the fuck of it. It wasn't like, it wasn't even really looking like, who am I going to give this to? It wasn't, it wasn't for that. Um, mm -hmm. And I met Mayor and he, then he started singing and he just popped off and I was like, oh, you know, I made, and we, we both were into these same kind of like, and you know, like people would be like, Prince, I mean, yeah, obviously Prince, he's the best. But like, we like the dudes that weren't as popular as Prince, like the underground version of it. It's a little different, right? Mm -hmm. It might be something like that from 1981 or whatever it is. And he was into those same things. So I started sending him tracks and he would just send me back songs. And then it's like, man, this is like kind of good. Like, it wasn't like even meant to be a whole project or none of that. But going back to the root of it, but you know, even pre hip hop, pre rappers delight, I mean, I, some of the first music I remember is like, oops, upside your head. And, you know, and the mm -hmm. beat goes on. That's my memories of like good times in the neighborhood. And I mean, I don't even know if it was a black party, black party. It was just what was playing all the time. Right. I could, I see the labels and I remember mm -hmm. that as a little kid, just watching it spin around. And when G funk used a lot of that stuff later on, I loved all that stuff because it just had, it made me feel that way. That same feeling and Tuxedo is just an extension of that. It's kind of like combining the G-Funk with some of that SOS and, you know, Gap Band, Leeway Burgess. I'm, I'm guessing you, know. you could roller skate. Oh, I could roller skate backwards. Come on, man. All right, we did a gig in... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we did a gig in Germany. We DJed. It was roller skating. And I put on the roller skates and went out there. It was hitting it backwards. I mean, I wasn't doing any tricks or nothing. But yeah, of course. Come on. That was, that was like, that was a school trip was the roller skating ring. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was a fun Saturday. So I, I mean, the part that to me that I never was seen is I got to sing backgrounds live and play keyboards and dance around. That was not supposed to be part of this at all, but the demand was there and I had to, I had to learn on the fly, which was terrifying, but it was probably good for me. I made me a way better producer because I feel like even in my rap beats, I'm playing way more than I was before, you know? It's just such an amazing, like, I, I don't think anybody that heard, especially the earlier part of your career, would have ever assumed that that would be the same dude. I, I wouldn't have either. I mean, this is, it was definitely not like a grand design, but, um, you know, like all these things, if, if it's working, I'm going to keep doing it. And um, I mean, we're going to Tokyo to DJ in two weeks or something. I mean, I, we were out there in March. <laughs> like, we wouldn't put it out about five years. Like, the people the thing is there's not a lot of people doing this at the level we're doing it so you know we we have our thing um 
And we it's it's kind of crazy because yeah, for as successful as it is, we don't really put that much time into it. It's not like where I'm like not every day like hammering away trying to make a beef for tuxedo. Like I'll make a bunch of rat beef and I'm like, man, I'm gonna make something for tuxedo today. Just like that. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. a big and then we get together and make songs and him just being so much better on the musical front, he makes some of the stuff I do that's probably technically wrong. He hones in and be like, nah, that chord tripping. <laughs> Get that out of there. I can't sing to that, you know? And I'm good at starting music and not finishing. He's good at finishing it. So we're just a good partnership in that way. Did you ever make something for Tuxedo that somebody ended up rapping to or vice versa? You well, ever make what, a hip hop beat that ended what's up being funny a Tuxedo is joint? The first Tuxedo song, um, I, I put the original beat just because I didn't know it was going to be for Tuxedo. I put it on a, um, a beat tape, no, BCD, and I sent it to, um, this is when Prodigy was in jail. I sent it to his wife. I was sending her beats. And he rapped to it. <laughs> There's a Prodigy song over the first Tuxedo mm, beat. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, there was definitely a point where I was starting to sample stuff that we had did. Like there was a Drake song that never came out that had some Tuxedo vocals and like one of our songs in it. People have sampled us, which is a weird feeling, you know? Um I mean, I, I think that's the cool thing. It could be, you know, it can, it, it can touch all these things. But yeah, when I'm doing tuxedo, I don't think the people that love tuxedo really probably understand the depth of what I've done. You know, they don't, that's not what they're there for. Some of them do. Has anybody ever clowned you for the tuxedo thing? Nah, like, they did love 50 it. ever see the tuxedo? Nah, f- and 50, like, would, 50 would probably mm. want to rap on some of that stuff though. Maybe. I mean, um, I think a lot of like the people in a the rapper, they're like the, the homies that are, they'll be like, yo, man, what? It's like this wedding band or whatever the f*** you're doing out there. That's it seems like it's popping. Like that's they'll more be like surprised by it. Um, you know, I have like Scarface text me like f*** with the tux or Poss or you know what I mean. Like people are just like, I wouldn't think they would be into it. So, but you know, that's the music they grew up on too. So I get it. You know. Yeah, it's one of those things that make complete sense if you grew up in black culture, especially in the '80s. Right. It was, it was just, that was, that's, that's the first music I really remember. I mean, and when I think about like, you know, did I, like, I know Zap, I know Zap Troutman, I know Lester Troutman, I know their family, I'm friends with them. You know what I mean? We did a song with them and it wasn't like I'm pushing them to do the song. They wanted to do it with us. Um, It's crazy, man. I mean, you couldn't have told me that as a little kid, like the, the guys that made Heartbreaker, I would, (laughs) I would know them. You know what I mean? Uh, or, or get to perform with yeah. him, you know, like it's crazy. Um, and, and, you know, when we first did our first show with them, they were just like, they were like, man, I can't believe how you guys got these records signed. And they're like, we got to do something. So like that meant we were doing it right. It was another just like affirmation, you know? Yeah. It reminds me of Ali Shaheed Muhammad with the jazz is dead thing. Right. For sure. Like it's a very similar kind of vibe mm-hmm. with him learning, learning to play and then actually like working with the heroes that he sampled. Right. Hell yeah. It's, it's very similar. And I think, I think we're always trying to find, you know, the next thing that's, that's interesting to us and challenging and, I love rap. I, I was I have a problem with people that like tap out on rap for whatever reason and just be like, well, no, nah, I'm a rock guitar player. It's like, well, did you really love rap in the first place? Like, so I'm always gonna do rap. That's just gonna be me. I'm always gonna do hip hop because that's the root of me. But like, it's not like, you know, I'm just there's some of these things I'm just gonna keep doing over and over. I gotta do something else just as a different creative outlet. You know what I mean? And this thing was in my heart just as much yeah. as hip hop, you know. Another thing that I notice about people that do it for a long time and have longevity is that they don't look back on their stuff very often. Like I don't find a lot of people that have that have, you know, especially people that have done a variety of of creative right. things. Like you don't find those people going back a whole lot. Right. But do you have joints that you're like, man, this this is who I am musically. Like this thing that I that I worked on is like, you know what I mean? Like what what would you want them to play at your funeral? Man, there's made. it's it's weird. There's there's ones that to me are my favorites, and then what's like the core of me? I don't really know. I feel like something like Rick Ross Money Dance, like that was me putting together like a little musicality that I got from the tuxedo thing. How I like to sample programming, all of it. I feel like I really nailed it with that, and I just got the right song on it, which is that's the hard part. Is I feel like I made great beats, 
maybe not the right song or maybe a beat I made was okay had the right song. And that one, it all, um, it all just sticks for me. Um, I mean, obviously, Rock Cocaine Flow kind of, but that was a weird one to me in the time because I couldn't really redo it. So, like, usually when you have a breakout thing, you're going to keep hammering that thing. And I couldn't do that. I wasn't just going to be like, duh, 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 every beat. Nah, we weren't going to do that. So, you did something similar with the, with the freeway. Joint. Freeway. That's the only There's other the... time I did it. Yeah. Uh, never There's a freeway change, one where he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the only one. Right. And it's like, and I've even had people ask me to do it. I'm just like, eh, it's kind of cheapening the whole thing to me to just keep running it out there, you know. And I, I feel grateful that it wasn't like mm -hmm. I made all these other pieces of music that that it's not like the only thing I ever made. I mean, or the John Cena thing is not the only thing I ever made. Even though the things that keep happening with it are just bizarre to me, like that it's just like lived in the 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 meme world and cultural zeitgeist to this degree is crazy. But it's not really what I'm known for. It's more like it's oh my god, you made that? Like it's more of that, you know what I mean? And I get a kick out of that more than anything. It's just you know. Yeah, I remember when that was going to be a I self divine song. Right. Yeah. See. See? Like when Shaka was rap was rapping on that, right? And it's just such a it's just such a great example of like, man, you do not know or have much control over where your music is going to go, how it's going to land, what thing is going to, and that's why the people that are are the most successful make and release and just have so much music, right? Because man, you could you could you, you could make a hundred beats and none of them land anywhere, and then. That hundred and first joint is the one that just just ends up being like a cultural phenomenon well, moment. And, and it's wild because you'll make you, you'll make a bunch of music in the moment, and it feels like oh nobody's picking this stuff, and you're a failure. And then somebody comes out with the same beat from one of those batches two years later, and you're like, oh shit, let's go back to those. <laughs> so yeah, it is it is totally out of my control. And as long as I keep working, I'm probably gonna get more. I mean. But it's not even like, yeah, you just can't try to do it. I think that's that is the most important thing. You can't just set out with this singular plan like I'm gonna get I'm gonna do a beat for this person this year. It's like you're not in control of that. Even the big dogs aren't really in control of that a lot of times. And you have to be willing to make a lot of music that's not it. You gotta be able to you gotta be willing to make a lot of music that is just I put all the inf effort and time and energy into this and I you know I pulled out all the things that I know how to do and it just nothing it's a nothing happened. Right. And well, then do and it again and then do it again and do it again and and some of those things will find their time later on or they won't. But in the end you're creating which should be what you love to do anyway, right? Like it's not like it's very rare. It, think when I start not liking something is when I have to do it. Like when, when it's like, yo, I need you to sequence this and put this part on. Then it becomes like a job. But if I'm just in, up in there working on stuff, I'm always gonna be happy doing that. Even if I would I'd never made a dollar doing this, I would probably still be doing it on some level. I'd still be buying records because it's just what I love to do. And it has to start with yeah. that, you know. Like it just has to. Everybody, every artist that I know or every like aspiring artist that I know that's always like, tell me what to do. Like, what's the secret? I always ask, like, how many songs have you completed? And it's never a hundred. It's never, you know what I'm saying? It's always like, well, I, yeah, well, I was trying to finish this one thing. And then, I mean, you know what I mean? They always have a small handful of music that they've actually completed. And like, man, that's the thing that, that's the thing that separates everybody I know that's successful from everybody I know that's not. I realized at a certain point, I read like an interview Alchemist did. I don't remember when this was. And he's, he's like, yeah, I used to have like beats set aside. Like, yo, but I'm going to give these to Jay-Z and this, you know. And then he was like, I'm never going to see Jay-Z. And I'm going to just keep making more stuff. And I think once I realized I was good enough that I could just keep, keep producing this thing at a certain level and... It wasn't the record. It wasn't the artist. It wasn't the machine. It was me. Then I then I had the confidence where I that's that started just giving the beats to everybody and just let it let it fall where it falls. You know, I'm not I'm not in control of anything but when I make the music in its initial form. You know, and and past that, 
it's 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 all it's up to the universe. It's like it's it's rap lottery. I mean, I think a lot of times, especially in like the like when I was doing G Unit, I would just make beats. I wouldn't know what's gonna be the one that's gonna send me to the path I want to go on, you know. And yeah, as long as I was enjoying it, then I was gonna keep doing it, you know. And I still feel that way. I mean, it's weird though. I do feel like, man, maybe I'll just retire. Like, but nobody ever retires, like, because you still just love doing it, right? Like, and and yeah. and then like announcing you're retiring is kind of funny because people do that, and then they end up just coming out with a record in two years. They're like, oh, I got bored. What was I really gonna do? Yeah, you know, nobody does the black album for real. No, nah, never. It never, <laughs> never, never. I think the thing is like you basically tell your ego. From now on, it I'm not gonna try to hit a certain level of success anymore. Right. And that almost like frees makes a person more free. You know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna try to duplicate the success that I had in the past. Right. Like I just saw I was just talking to Crazy Legs and he's like, Yeah, I got my last show coming up. I'm gonna perform it at uh at Yankee Stadium and it's gonna be my last show ever. And and I'm just like, so you're telling me that like if you if you are you know you happen across and there's a cipher and there's like people that are getting loose in the cipher like you're not going to jump in the cipher you know what i'm saying like this is impossible like it's impossible to do that but there's something about just telling you giving yourself permission absolutely especially if somebody thinks they're nice like man especially if he sees somebody he used to compete with like there's no way legs is not getting in the cipher it's happening but I'm saying it, it's just like it's something where, where, where for people where it's like the acknowledgement that I'm not going to try to compete with levels of success, whether it's like a certain quality that I used to make or like a certain uh, thing that I used to be able to do. I'm not going to try to continue to keep doing right. that. When, and I think that but is. But that's really that is, just like another level, a new a new chamber for people. That is truly the hardest thing once you do have success is. You're, you're always chasing it, you know? And I think there, there definitely hit a certain point that that was like hindering what I was making because it, I was too worried about that. And at a certain, I don't know, I feel like, yeah, I don't know. During COVID, I really just stopped caring, period. Like, I just like, I don't care. I'm just going to do this for me. We're going to see where it goes, you know? And it's it's been working, but... You know, it could easily not work too, and I, I think I'd be okay with it <laughs> at this point. But I don't know. There's, I think there's just that competitive thing in anybody. Is if you're great at something, you just, you just want to be, you want to feel like you're in the mix. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like guys that they're friends with that were athletes. You know, that play professional sports. Like, they don't just go mess around on the basketball court. Like they got paid millions of dollars to do this. They're professionals. You know what I mean? Right. Just like, I don't just go to somebody's studio and be like, yo, let's make beats. That ain't fun to me. If I'm making beats, it's because I care. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, so like, I, I, I feel like for me, that's going to have to be like getting better at, at instruments and like, it'll have to be in a space that I don't feel like I ever really was competing. You know what I mean? Like that's, that would be like the next thing for me, like just going and jamming with people because there's that that can't be considered me competing with anything. Man, yeah, it definitely seems like if 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 Dre would change the name so <laughs> that it's no longer detox, like the, then we could have probably had five Dr. Dre records. Yeah, I mean, I mean, who's, who's it seems say- like the pressure of because I'm saying we got the Compton record, we got yeah. the you know what I mean, like if he would just not have the pressure of like, I'm all right, I'm detox is no longer happening. Here's music. Here's just some music. Like I think there that there probably could have been I mean the crazy thing with him is he's making music right now. <laughs> so like it's still happening. Um he just doesn't know how to he isn't how to function without that, you know? Yeah. Like that's that's who he is and that's life for him. But in 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 the moment you'll be in there and Everybody might believe it's coming out that's in the studio. I'm just skeptical. So I'm like, this shit ain't coming out. That's me. <laughs> but the guys that are in there every day, they they fully believe something's coming out. Mm-hmm. I mean, and some of the records that he had were really amazing. They really were, you know, not everything, but like anybody. 
Um, and the stuff he's let go was amazing. The stuff we end up getting to hear because he let it go, all great. Yeah. So, you know, if if you just if you put those songs together and make an album, yeah, it was a great album. <laughs> but there's it's I think for somebody like him who's like your accomplishments are just so vast and powerful. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know how to react if I was him. Um, I just, I know he still loves making music though. And I, and I, and I love that part about it, that he's, he still goes to the studio every day and, you know, he's got a team of dudes working over there around the clock. Like it's crazy, you know, mm-hmm. um, for me, like just get when, when he, um, when he asked me to, you know, do a deal with him, whenever that was, White Band Music, because I remember we made the song with Ish, Home, um, from White Band Music, the same day we made that, when Ish came and did his verse, I got the call from him, and I was in the studio, and Vitamin was next to me, and I was it's like, yo, that's him, that's Dr. Dre, and the studio I was at had a big poster of him on the wall, it was a trip, it was like he was talking to us through the poster, mm. Um you know, those those are the kind of things you're just like, I made it. You know what I mean? They can't nobody take that away from me. Right. Like when I was a kid, I was really big into to getting like autographs of like my favorite baseball players and basketball players and stuff. And then at some point, when I was like a freshman in high school, I was like, I'm too old for this. I'm never getting nobody's autograph ever again. So then I, I took it to an extreme, wouldn't even like ask nobody for a picture. You know, you know the Ice Cube song. We we live that, right? We live we live the bylaws of uh, mm-hmm. of, of I'm not going to say the song, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, right, right. So then I started being like, I'm trying to get a signed check from my heroes. You know, like that's what I that's the ultimate mm, respect, mm, right? Mm, mm, mm. That's the autograph. That's yeah, the autograph. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, so yeah, it, it's 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 wild. Like just. I mean, I saw Dre maybe four years ago and like he was excited to see me and that was crazy in itself to me. He was like, what you got? You know, I'm like, damn, this dude knows who I am still. You know, like that's crazy. It's one of the reasons I do this. That's incredible. If you if you had to, you know, there's something that I always want to confirm with people because as somebody who has made music that people love but have never never reached certain level of status. So you've had that status. And you've also had the like, if the full embrace of of your heroes. Mm. If you could, if you could have one or the other, which one would it be? Uh, man, um, I don't really believe in the the OC lyric. The uh, I'd rather be broke than have a whole lot of respect. I don't think he would say that right now because I think when you get older, mm. you'd probably rather have a little more money. But for me. DJ Premier being my friend and Dr. Dre knowing who I am, and Battle Cat, that's more important than the public adulation for me. Because I didn't really start, I think doing, mm-hmm. being a producer, you're not really supposed to be the dude that's like the star, right? Like that, I wasn't doing it for that. Mm. But that I made stuff that that my heroes liked and they they took me in as, as you know, like a little homie peer type thing. Yeah, I mean that's that's the best. You know what I mean? That's by far the best. I mean, though it it you know once once I did tuxedo and we're playing for like fifteen hundred people and they're singing the lyrics, that's an ill feeling too. I'm not gonna lie. That's that's very different than even making a beat that plays out and you see people go crazy to it because everybody in that moment doesn't know you did that, right? None of them usually do where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> so being on that stage. It's it's definitely something. I mean, that's something you had this whole time, right? Like, just your ability to get in front of people and, and make them love you, and command that stage is you know that's a rare commodity. There's a lot of dudes that made big records and all that. They can't do that, you know. Yeah, this thing is incredible. It's just it's such a. Um, I always really feel for people who don't have the opportunity to do what they love for a living. Like whether it's being on, whether you're ever on stage in front of other people right. or like whatever it is, just the the feeling of doing the thing that makes you want to get up and that that is connected to the way that you feed your family and right. you know take care of yourself. It's just something that um, and it's such a mystery to me of like why some people are able to do it and others aren't. Well, I, I know from my perspective. It wasn't something I ever thought it was. I mean, it was such a pipe dream. It wasn't like a realistic thought to be like, 
I'm going to do beats for every rapper and make money and not, you know, never have to have a job for 20 years. Like that was definitely not a consideration even. So I didn't grow up attached to that idea. I just figured I'm going to work a job like everybody else, you know, Mm -hmm. and still make music and love it. But I think. And you had a job for a long time. Like even when you had had some, some known records, like you still kept a job. I did keep a job for probably too long, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a. I, don't, I I just think like, I think there's people who are talented that don't make it for whatever reason, but usually if you do it long enough, you get your shot. And I've just seen it happen too many times where everybody gets their shot, man. Like you might not perform the right thing in that moment or it might not go your way but if you're really good you're gonna get your shot it's just not on your time you know unfortunately and and i think where we're at now is really hard to cut through right we we came along in a time where everybody wasn't making beats or rapping right still took a financial you know emotional just hard work commitment to make that first 10 songs even. Whereas now, I mean, this is like playing a video game, right? I mean, anybody could just set up a mic and make a song. Yeah. Um, and and upload it, you know, all these things, like, and out to the world. So to, to make a song that's good enough that somebody deem quality enough to put their own money behind to get it in stores across the, the country. Yes. I uh, mean, your odds were, you know, pretty low, but there wasn't as many people doing it at the same time. So if you did come out in that time, you just got way more of, uh, you got way more of a shot at making an impact because you weren't competing with the numbers, you know. Yeah, like I think about the fact that for me to make my demo tape, I got on a Greyhound bus <laughs> and went to Houston from Minneapolis and sat in a hotel room. <laughs> Because I found somebody in a Muslim newspaper that had recording equipment that he would let me use. And he set it up in the in the hotel room for me. And I sat there for a four-day weekend in a Red Roof Inn and recorded all my raps and then took that back to Minneapolis and had somebody put it on a, you know what I mean? Like put the put the lyrics over the beats and then my friend had to get beat up by the police and win a settlement so that we could get the money for, you know what I'm saying? So that I could actually put the tape out. And then Sadiq had to, you know, it's just like, man, yeah, so many things that it required to just get your voice onto a tape for people to be able to hear it was, it was a lot. It was, it just, it just made it more of a coveted thing, right? Like- right. Once, once we got, once we got computers and, and home recording, it took this the the special nature out of just a recorded voice, you know, right. because it's not. I mean, if you listen to like all these people tell it from, I mean, I'll listen to like a podcast of like some dude that was DJing in like seventy five talk about. It seemed like there was a million crews of dudes rapping and doing routines in New York. It wasn't just the like ten we hear about, right? You know, yeah, it was not just the Cold Crush Brothers. No, it was a ton of them. Mm-hmm. So. But that going in a studio and somebody putting your record out, totally different thing, you know, just the financial commitment, you know, right. all those guys would have had records now. <laughs> like, Yeah. And I think one of the main things, like I'm saying, is just like the ability to live with what, so you have an idea or a vision in your head of what you want to happen with your music. And that's almost never how it is. Even the people that make it, it's never the way that they think they're going to make it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, do you do do you have a vision in your mind, a dream? You go after it, and then something different happens. Whether it's like smaller, or it's not the fans that you thought it was going to be, or it's not whatever. Can you live with that and keep going? Like, can you have the the discipline to keep going even though it's not what you wanted it to be? You know what I'm saying? Like that seems to be the 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 difference between whether whether or not you keep going. And like you said, like it comes down to the love of it. Like, do I love this thing enough? 
Because it's the same way with a woman. Like you fall in love with your wife and you have some amazing dream of what having a family is going to be like or what it's going to be like to to be with the person you love. And three years in, it's not what you thought it was going to be. No, but it's no. like, man, I love you so much that I'm going to I'm gonna just keep getting up and making you breakfast in the morning, even though this is not what I thought it was going to be. But I love you that much. And like the commitment to do that, even though when this thing isn't what you... And it's funny because I remember when, when Rock Cocaine Flow came out, you know, I had just put my first album out. That's when Shadows on the Sun was out. Right. And Pa said, everyone cools off from being hot. It's about if you can handle being cold or, cold not. or not. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. You know what I mean? Like Daylight's having another moment, but it's been a minute since Daylight's last moment. You know right. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And like say, well, we used to stay consistent ever since. Like those, hearing those kind of gems and being like, man, Dealing with the disappointment of this not being what we wanted it to be and still being dedicated enough to to continue to to keep doing it. It really feels like that is the that's the difference. Well, I mean, you gotta you gotta somehow tap into that joy that got you there in the first place. And whatever it is that gets mm -hmm. you to that place. That's what you have to discover. For me, it's like it could be doing tuxedo for a while because there's not the pressure on that to me that the other stuff was in the time. Once once tuxedo got a little too hot, I'm like, damn, we got to make another do it. That was crazy to feel that from. And then it's my record, so it felt personal if we don't we don't succeed. You know what I mean? Before, if I do a beat for somebody and they fail, I'm like, especially if I don't personally really care about them, we don't have a relationship. I'm like, shit, that's cool. All right, I got the next thing coming. But like when it's your thing, shit, <laughs> it feels different. It feels way different, you know? It's like a personal, personal, you know, uh, slight to you when people don't like your stuff like that. And you look at Dayla, mm -hmm. I mean, what what were they, when, when Grind Day came out it was 2004. So, I mean, they had been at it damn near 20 years at that point. That's crazy. Because what when is uh yeah it was probably sixteen years after when when was when was plug tune in 87, 88? 80, yeah something like that it seems like they had been around a long time like you know Lord Finesse is like out of all the old school guys that I've met and become we're really we're really good friends he's like I feel like he's my role model of how you're supposed mm -hmm. to age and rap like he's just just a great dude just a just a, one of the best people to be around. Not all salty, not complaining. He's just like enjoying being him. So comfortable in his skin. And mm. I think about like, damn, you put out your first album when you were 16. You know, his 50th birthday party, I remember thinking, I remember thinking surprised he was only 50. Right. You know? And he hasn't put out a, he hasn't put out an album since Awakening, which was probably like 98. And people still care because what he did in that moment was that powerful. But he's never been content. He puts me up on like technology of like, yo, there's this trick on Ableton. Like, I think it's dope that I learned that from him, that he's even still engaged like that. So that's the kind of stuff that keeps me going. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I see see the guys that have every right to complain about whatever it is, and they're not, they're just happy doing this. How can I complain? You know what I mean? Yeah. Just be happy that you made this a thing and then you get to feed your family. Yeah, man. Well, man, I, you've been so generous. I got a hundred other things I could ask, but we could just do it again. We'll do it again, man. Come on. <laughs> For sure. All right, man. Peace. Yeah, man. Appreciate you, brother. You too. Special thanks to my friend, my brother, Jake One, for being so generous with himself and with his time and his stories and his wisdom and all of that. It's really dope to be talking to him in the house that belonged to his father. And I'm just grateful for him sharing so much of himself. Um, make sure to check out the Behind the Beat series that Jake does on YouTube. Um, you can also you know, follow him on uh, Twitter. He's hilarious on Twitter and on across social media. All of the work that he's done and continues to do, the projects that keep coming out, and also his worth work with Tuxedo, which to me is hilarious, but it is really, really dope music. It's just hilarious to see Jake One and Mayor Hawthorne be 
one of the leaders of like the new funk movement, you know what I'm saying? Up there with the shades on and a tuxedo is a trip. But I'm very grateful to Jake for coming through and for sharing himself and his time and his wisdom and stories with us. Um, make sure to head to brotherali.com and get in the join section, the caravan. You know, those are the people that really make this podcast happen. Uh, also, betterhelp.com slash travelers to get down with the therapy journey. And of course, this, of course the Zakat Foundation. Uh, shout out to all the people that listen to this podcast and give me feedback every week. People like my man Omar B., and uh, Chaplain Shane Atkinson and Rami Neshashibi and Aida Rashid and my Mike Madsen and all of the people that I hear from on a regular basis. It really means a lot to me. Um, shout to Mansur Panawala and Amna Mirza, who were really instrumental at the foundation of the podcast. Shout to my man Mark from Medina Hip Hop, who created the logo, Ant that did the music. Uh, Last Word has helped out with some of the graphic design stuff. And... Um, you know, but most of all, it's me and my man BK1. BK1 is the producer of the podcast and is a production of Travelers Media. We love you. We appreciate you all. We'll see you next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.